Good morning and thank you all for joining us on Azure Kubernetes Day. My name is Rashmita and I'm the event planner for Microsoft Reactor Bengaluru, India. The session will run over the next three hours, including Q&A. The session will be uploaded to our Reactor YouTube channel. Also, please feel free to do event check-in to access all the resources from today's session. But before we start the session, I would request all of you to read our code of conduct. I would now like to welcome Vivek, our host for today's session. Over to you, Vivek. Thanks, Rishmita. I'm just sharing my screen. Okay, so um, welcome all to Azure Communities Day. And uh, I just want to talk about the agenda today. We have a couple of things. You know, it's basically an amazing lineup of uh, amazing community leaders coming in and uh, speaking about uh, different scenarios uh, with respect to Azure Kubernetes. And also, uh, also a great, we will have a good chat with uh, Vishal, who will we'll also talk about uh, general uh, Kubernetes as well. So, uh, you know, let me show you the agenda. Uh, okay. So agenda is basically I will work, you know, we will just introduce to uh, Azure Kubernetes service and uh, we will go through the service. By the way, uh, I'll be hosting this, the whole event as well. So I'm, you know, senior cloud advocate and I'm part of the cloud and AI engineering at Microsoft. And uh, we will just spend some time in terms of, uh, you know, deploying a simple app and then the microservice app and then we will, you know, look into the different monitoring system and other things. Uh, and then there will be, you know, amazing session from Renu uh, with respect to the bridge to Kubernetes. So it's basically, uh, you know, how we uh, debug code locally. If you have different microservices, how do we debug? It's amazing for developers to use. And uh, this will be an amazing session as well. And I will have a chat with Vishal and then we have uh, Ambrish Gangoli coming in, uh, talking about deep learning model, how to build it and deploy it on different apps. You know, it's basically container apps using AC, you know, AC, uh, you know, SEI, and then also on the uh, uh, AKS. Okay, so um, we also have community partners for this session, and uh, we have uh, Elastic. You all know Elastic uh, user group. Uh, which is which is in 12 cities amazing group that they, they do a lot of sessions do take a look at it and uh, you know uh, azure developer community which is in 100 cities they are doing amazing job you know there's so many sessions which is being drive driven for the community and uh, soda foundation if if you don't know about soda foundation you know just join in uh, and see what it is it is an open data framework and if you if you want to know more about it and uh, do comment in the chat uh, so that uh, we can schedule a session with them and uh, you know uh, we can work towards how how this sort of foundation is built uh, especially from the framework perspective how to use that framework and other other things and there is open community as well which is a developer community uh, amazing uh, community for students uh, do join in they do a lot of sessions for students uh, if you want to know more just go to the github repo which is at the bottom of the you know, a slide, you know, just go to that GitHub repo, you will be able to access all these uh, communities. And, and also uh, in that GitHub repo, you can, you know, you will get the on-demand link uh, from uh, various things which is uh, being done today. And also there are a couple of hacks which will be launched uh, maybe on Monday, you will see some hacks coming in as well. So let's deep dive today's session uh, from, uh, from a community's perspective, I just want to make sure that uh, for the newbies who have joined in today, uh, I want to make sure that you understand Kubernetes first, uh, even before we deep dive into the Azure Kubernetes service. So what is Kubernetes? Sir? Okay, so um, Kubernetes is an orchestrator for containers and it's basically, um, you know, it has a simple structure, a simple architecture, which is master node and there are worker nodes and it is a declarative 
uh, system, which is which is which means that um, a user, you know, has a desired state, and he he key in keys in the desired state and submit the desired state to the uh, API server, which is which is on the master node. And you can see that uh, from the diagram itself, uh, the master node has an API server, and this API server uh, takes in the uh, desired state, which is in the form of YAML, which is written in the form of YAML, and takes in the desired state and converts it into uh, you know making sure that it enforces that specific desired state to be applied on the worker nodes which is there so which is a client right so basically you are declaring what you want uh, the, you know how to uh, define the infrastructure for the you know containers which is out there how do you define it and how do you uh, submit it to the uh, worker node and then worker node runs it right so that is the uh, simple architecture and of course, there are a couple of components. Uh, Xset, which is which is a database. It's a memory database which is uh, which is having the uh, complete information about the cluster. And there is control manager and schedulers, which has its own role in terms of uh, creating new desired states and other things. And scheduler making sure that uh, the you know uh, the pods are being uh, deployed and and also it is it's basically making sure the you know networking and other things which is which is part of the uh, worker node right well, which is part of the container access and other stuff so this is the simple um, architecture uh, if you go to the previous github repo which i showed you um, this one Though uh, I will be uploading a couple of uh, you know documents and videos and other things, which we have done deep dive, deep dive sessions for understanding Kubernetes itself, so you can uh, access that. So keep a note of this specific GitHub repo. Um, so, so today we are talking about uh, managed Kubernetes, right? So it's it's, it's specifically to uh, Azure Kubernetes service. So why it is so important? So I just wanted to you know share a couple of my perspective on it. So if you have a self-managed master node, uh, you will have to manage the API server, you will have to manage the database, you will have to manage the different uh, components, which is like schedulers and the control managers and even the you know some of the uh, cloud controllers, which is required. And then there is, uh, you know, Obviously, all these things needs to be patched, scale, reliability things which you need to do. So, if you are using the you know managed services like Azure Kubernetes service, so what will happen is you know you all these things are taken care. Of. The, the the master node components are taken care. Of. So anything with respect to upgrades, anything with respect to patches, it is being taken care, of. and it's it's basically. Uh, highly, uh, it it makes sure that it is available and uh, it is easy for you to manage in different availability zones as well. And then, you know, uh, you can obviously secure this. And there is self healing if it goes down. There is a self healing mechanism which is out there, and also uh, the monitoring system for API server itself has been enabled onto the uh, Azure managed control plane, right? So. And that it's no cost. So there is no uh, cost to this. So whenever you spin up a master node, uh, there is no cost. So basically you have one master node and you can spin it up with one um, worker node for your dev test uh, uh, dev test scenarios. Uh, obviously in production uh, recommendations is to have at least three worker node and other things. So, so basically that is the uh, simple way to build a simple production. So given that with the understanding of why you need a managed communities uh, and why it is so important uh, we what we will do now is obviously we'll deep dive into demos uh, i don't want to spend more time on the slides so what we will do is we'll bring up a cluster we will you know uh, deploy a simple uh, app to communities we'll also deploy microservice app but we will use the github actions to that uh, we will see the scenario where uh, how a real world uh, scenario into where uh, developer is pushing the code and code is going into uh, going into Kubernetes uh, and directly with 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 the use of uh, GitHub Actions, 
and then we will spend some more time with the, with the Azure components, which is there, you know, monitoring services for containers and some of the policies which you can enable as well from a, from a different uh, management perspective as well. And then we will deep dive into some, some of the cloud skill challenge, which, which, will, which will help you to learn Kubernetes in production, right? So this is the agenda for today. I'll spend some 45 minutes and then we will, you know, spend some time in Q and A. And then uh, we have Renu coming in and talk about bridge, uh, bridge to Kubernetes uh, extension. And then Vishal Biani and uh, Amrish coming in talking about different uh, parts of the Kubernetes, right? So I'll not spend more time here. So let's go and build a Kubernetes cluster. So you, you can see the portal. So I am in Azure portal. So I'm increasing the zooming in so that you can see the services. So I have a couple of resources already built, but I will show you how to build one. So what are the components and required? So if you go and click on the create a new resource here. So when you click on the new resource, you go under the containers, uh, you can see, you know, there is community service. So this is Azure community service, how to create one. You can see here and also note that there is docs link and also MS learn link. So MS learn link will point you to the all the learning modules, which is required here for, for learning or getting started with Kubernetes. And, uh, and obviously docs has the detailed explanation of things to get started. So let me start with this so when you click on the create uh, you will come into the uh, basic uh, page and you will choose a specific resource group where you want to create this specific uh, cluster and you can name it right uh, azure kubernetes day and we can name it as a new one uh, kts day it's always used as kts so let us use that way and then you will give it a name so we can say, some, give it a, some name and you can choose where you want to create and you can have availability zones. So when I when what it means is if you see this, uh, if you carefully read this, right? So let me zoom in and also show you this. So it means is basically, you know, if you are having uh, high availability zones enabled, your nodes will get created and node pools is created across these uh, different physical locations, right? So what happens is whenever there is a failure and other things, you can use this as one of the uh, thing and make sure that you can build it, right? So basically you can, um, you can make sure that your nodes are highly available in different places. So, uh, so that if something happens to the master node, or your sorry, not the master, the um, the other nodes which you have, which is worker nodes, it is called as. If something happens to that, this will take care of that. You know that uh, bringing it up again, and also it's available in different locations. So that is the thing. So it has different versions as well. So you can choose the different versions, um, whichever is the latest. Default is this one, but you can also use the latest one, which is which has been released, and you can have a primary node pool. So primary node pool is about. Uh, choosing the right size which you want and this is like range you can give whether it is auto scaling or manual so the moment you choose manual it becomes manual so there is no auto scaling count and auto scaling is from one to five you can scale so that is the standard uh, node size but these are all primary nodes it's not a secondary node it's all primary nodes right and there is node pool and this is where you define uh, different nodes uh, which is required uh, in a specific situations where you, know, you are scaling and variety of different workloads, you can just click on add node pool and choose the right set of things with OS system model and uh, node size and availability zones and maximum pods uh, you want to run on that node pool, right? So that is what it does. And there is virtual node. Um, and a virtual node is nothing but a virtual kubelet. Uh, virtual kubelet is a CNCF project. And uh, we will talk about that with Vishal Biani, uh, what it means for, from a scale perspective um, and how, how community scales using the virtual node, right? So 
that's something we will discuss and there are uh, virtual scale, you know machine scale set as well uh, to scale your uh, scale your uh, communities so that is one part of it and then there is that authentication there are two kinds of authentication where you can do service principle and this uh, system assigned managed identity this is uh, basically assigned uh, when you create and also there is service principle so service principle is is you create to access different different services of Azure, right? So basically, if you're using load balancer of Azure or container registry of Azure, you want to use it with service principle, you can also use it or you can also uh, create a new one. So this is role-based access. These are all Kubernetes concepts. Anyways, um, I don't want to go deep dive into what is Kubernetes here because uh, the focus here is to learn uh, Azure Kubernetes than the um, you know the Kubernetes itself. For that, I will anyways uh, provide you the you know all the detailed uh, uh, workshop which we have done at the reactor, in, which will be available made available on the GitHub repo which which I showed you, right? So there is anyways uh, there are two kinds uh, where authentication level is. One is obviously the Azure uh, Active Directory which is out there, and you can use it with uh, KDS managed and role based access, which is which is a default one. So there are networking, uh, different networking. This is default networking from communities, and this is Azure CNI. It's it allows you to you know provide you with a lot of different varieties and also different IP uh, number of IPs it provides, and it also directly connect with VNet and other things which is provided by um, the uh, uh, Azure itself. And there are you can enable it as private cluster and other things for security reasons and network policies as well. There are different policies also you can enable uh, on top of it. Anyways, when we talk about policies, we will take a look at that and we'll try and see how to create a policy as well. And then there is container registry integration. So you can, I have already have a container registry. So that is something which you can do. And then there is monitoring. You can enable it later. Uh, this is specifically for container. So Azure monitor, for containers is something that is available where it it picks in uh, container insights. It is more built on uh, container specific things, and we will anyways uh, see a demo of that and then policies itself. So just we just need to create after review, and once you do that, you have the cluster with you, and once the cluster is up and running, so all you need to do is uh, deploy an app to it, right? So we will just deploy a simple app and uh, we will see how exactly uh, this works as as i told you um kubernetes uh, you know it's it's a declarative uh, tool right so you need to define the desired state and then deploy the code right so basically this is the uh, desired state which i have right now you can see the desired state here so it has been defined so it is it is uh, it is having those, uh, you know, deployment kind, and I'm using the uh, the manifest uh, YAML, right? So it is basically I'm using the deployment kind here, and then a couple of things uh, which I have provided here, and there's you know the limitations from the CPU, what I need to use, and other things, and then I've added a, a service on top of that. So service is nothing but to how to access this specific uh, pod. And as you know, pod can have many containers or can have single containers. So basically it is depending on your strategy. Um, that is one thing. And then there is a uh, front end, uh, which we have, and uh, which is associated to load balancer. So we have uh, built a service kind on top of the load balancer. So this is something, uh, you know, it's, it's basically a, you know, it's a manifestation. So it's, you have defined the required, um, uh, required information there so you just need to drive this required information and and just apply this uh, code to the cluster so how do i do that first thing is you need to have an access to the cluster so all you need to do is to run i've already run this so this is the command so what it does is you just need to give your resource group name cluster name and get credentials once you have logged in as uh, as a login. So basically you need to have CLI, install CLI of Azure, and you should have as a login. And once you log in uh, and, and run this get credentials, you will get the credentials. 
of the uh, yeah you know of the Kubernetes cluster. Once you have the cluster, you just need to apply it. It's a simple command. You can see here uh, the YAML file which I was showing you. I just need to uh, you know kubectl apply it and then uh, just watch it uh, to be created. So when I apply, so let's uh, see. So when I apply and get service. So what will happen is it's showing me the external IP address and that is, that's all. So it's very simple. So I just take this uh, YAML. This is a simple app, right? Simple application. Uh, it has one front end, it has a back end, and I'm just using that app and I'm taking the uh, external uh, IP address and pushing this, uh, sorry, I'm taking that file and uh, applying it and getting this external IP address to access the application. So it's a simple way to deploy an app. Um, let me go and show you the, the code. So this is, you know, this is the app. So basically, if you see this, it's an Azure voting app. Uh, it's a simple app where it is talking about uh, are you a cat person or you a dog person? So you you can in fact answer this question if you go to that IP address and uh, answer this question. It, it's, it, you know you can I, I, we can see the count, right? So if you are an audience, so just you can play around with it. But uh, the most important thing here is it was so easy for me to bring up the application, right? So it was just uh, I I was able to just go and create a cluster and cluster was ready for me. And I'm taking that, uh, you know, the uh, the YAML file, the manifest file, and taking that and just pushing it to the um, pushing it to the Kubernetes cluster. So that's that's a very simple way to get started. So now what we will do is we will go and see how to deploy a microservice application. And if I have a microservice application, how do I deploy that uh, to with with a GitHub action? So how do I use uh, Kubernetes cluster with GitHub Actions, right? Which is Azure Kubernetes cluster I'm talking about. And so that you can uh, build and deploy and build uh, various things with Kubernetes, right? So let's go back and uh, see the code for, first we will see the code of application and then we will uh, see how to define the GitHub Action for that. And what are the components you need uh, to build and deploy to uh, to Kubernetes cluster using GitHub Actions. And then we will uh, spend some time there in terms of learning uh, different components of it, right? So let me go to the code. Let me open the code for microservice app, which we have. It's in the repos. To do app uh, open. Yeah, save it. Okay, so now I have opened the microservice app. So you can see this is my microservice app, and um, this is the deployment YAML. So it has a couple of things. Okay, so one, there are four different services, four different code. If you see this. There is database API you have, there is stats API, there is front end, and there is stats worker. So it's basically what it is doing is there is a front end, uh, there is a stats API. Whenever you push the push something into the to-do list, it takes in and adds it into database and also maintains the state with the cache, which is Redis cache, and also uses Q, which is RabbitMQ to you know process these you know process these events okay so let me show you the app as well so that you will get a, an idea of what we are building so this is the to do app so i have built this to do app uh, and this is something which you can create so this is what it is so if i do add add a new task to it and you can see the stats here this is where the microservice component comes here this is a different uh, service which is there and this is an API which is where you can see if I created three completed 
uh, status of the to do app so this is built on to do mvc famous uh, to do mvc uh, application which is which is there so it's a simple code um, let me go back to the code which i was explaining so i have all these different uh, different services to be built so how do i go about doing it uh, if i am using azure community service how do i go about using this right so basically first thing we will do is we will go and create a container registry, right? I need a container registry where I have to store these containers, right? So uh, I'll go here and go to my portal back to portal and create a resource, okay? And go to containers again, and I have a container registry. Click on the container registry and you will see, you know, container registry coming up and you will create a couple of, you know, you know, select the uh, resource group and then some name, give a name to it and go and just create a container registry. So when you create a container registry, you have a container registry up and running for you. But the most important thing you need to understand about container registry is also you need to have an access to it, right? So you just go to container registry and see this. This is, uh, this is my container registry, which is, which I've already created. So you can see there is uh, some of these uh, repositories. Uh, if you see, uh, it has all these uh, version one of these is ready, right? So all you can see, this is uh, the uh, different code, which is images uh, is ready. This is a version one, but these are images which is built by GitHub Actions and other things. So anyways, we'll come there. So first thing is we will see, let me show you uh where we are here yeah. okay so let me show you docker images right so all i have to do is let me go to the to do app and just go into the just go into say for example front end i want to build front end so just go into the uh, front end i have written a docker file so you just need to run docker build uh and say it is front end version three and save right so it's, if you do that it will just build the version three and uh, you will have the version three here right so so whenever you need different versions you do it so you just need to do a like docker images and you will see all the built images so i had built the version once and i have the uh, built images but what is this this is this is on my um, this is on my registry, which is on Azure, right? So how do I uh, access this or how do I push once I have the package built? It's very simple. Just uh, go into your Visual Studio and go to the Docker extension and you will see that it is connected to Azure and you can see these are the images which is there. All I need to do is just right click on this and just push it. So when I push it, it will connect to my uh, Azure, and then obviously I have logged in into the uh, uh, into the Visual Visual Studio Code with with Azure account, right? So uh, you can see here uh, my registry name is here. I just need to select these and just push it, and it gets pushed. And because it takes a lot of time, so I'm not showing you how to push it and stuff. But it is already pushed, and the version one is already there and you just need to click these buttons so that will go through so this is this is manually pushing it so i have the code and i build the code i package the code and in using the um, using the docker commands and then i am pushing it to the container registry but this is everything is done through uh, done through manually right but i if i have to do this with an automated way and use the components which is required for uh, running this through an automated way as a developer i just need to push the code to <coughs> sorry push the code to um, go to github and from there the code is getting deployed onto uh, onto the cluster that is what i want to drive right so if i have to do that i have to go and build a Okay, I have to build the um, the workflow, 
right? So GitHub workflow. So how do I do that? So all I need to do is, uh, you know, push this code into the GitHub repo, which is to do app repo, which I have. And when you push this code here, I have the code here. And then you can see there is actions. Uh, I can go to the actions and then just create a new workflow and just create new workflow. And then there is setup workflow for yourself. When you click on the setup workflow on yourself and you just set up your workflow, um, the setup, the code is anyways, uh, we will go through that. So let me show you the code as well for the workflow which we have. So it's on my Visual Studio, it's easier to see. Um, I can see the code. So purposefully I have removed on push uh, because I was playing around with it. We can remove this and make it on push as well. Um, this is a simple uh, way to dispatch. The dispatch is workflow dispatcher. Basically you can, it's a manual dispatch, but on there are different ways to do it from a GitHub workflow where you can go and do it on, on push. When the code is getting pushed, it gets pushed, right? And then there is environment variables, which I have set. And you can see, uh, I have set the registry name, cluster name, uh, resources, and what is the namespace where I want to deploy this code? Uh, what is the secret name which we want to create? Uh, and then there is, you know, app uh, name, and then these are different apps which we are going to build, right? So this is the name of those uh, different code which we are going to build. So that is what I've said, and I've been using Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu server or runner, which is the Ubuntu infrastructure to do it. To, to do any of the activities, uh, you need an infrastructure to do the build, to do Docker build and anything, you need an infrastructure in doing that. And there is already pre-built actions. Uh, this is a simple checkout action, which is always there. It, brings out you know brings in the code uh, into the runner uh, that's what this means and then it's there are a couple of simple use cases uh, where um, you might need the um, you might need azure help so azure has already built a couple of actions for you how does how do how do i how do you see these actions how do you learn these actions it's very simple uh, just go to the azure slash login and just copy this and then go to uh, github.com slash Azure. And you can see that, you know, you can see all these uh, actions available here. So you can see actions.yaml and you can see what, what needs to be done. So there are a couple of things are true, which means it is required. You can see now better, okay. So it is required and sometimes it is not required. So it will be false and other things. There will be default and other things. So this one has everything for true. So that's how you have, uh, that's how you build it. And the most important thing is the secret. So you can see there are a couple of uh, secrets which has been enabled here. So dollar secret dot registry name. And also you can see, you know, while, while I'm talking about secret, also you can see Azure credentials and other things. So we were looking at one of the file, which uh, documents, repos, code. Okay. So here, so you can see this. And let me bring up view and word wrap. Okay. You can see this command. So if you run this command, uh, basically you can get all those information. There will be a JSON file, which will be created. You just need to copy that JSON file into the uh, GitHub secrets. So how do I do that from a GitHub secret perspective? So this is specifically for uh, to connect with Azure Kubernetes, right? So you go to, uh, go to my app, go to settings here and in settings, go to secrets. And you can see there are a couple of secrets I have set. So this is Azure credentials, which I have set. So you just need to create a new repository secret and you will be able to copy the JSON here and you'll be able to run it. So that's how you do uh, this, you know, bring in the secrets and access all these things through secrets, right? So, so basically I have the GitHub 
uh, you know, the workflow ready. So this is how it uses. There are a couple of uh, actions items which is there. Uh, do check out these action items for your uh, learning purpose. If you know, if you go to the, specifically this Azure KH deploy, um, it basically uh, is about the complete uh, things which you need to do from a deploy perspective. So let me show you uh, the actions it provides. A uh, bunch of things. It, it is a very important one. So it it's it is providing with the the way you want to deploy the the blue green deployments the canary deployments the way you want to deploy uh, traffic uh, percentage of traffic redirections to different deployments so you can see all these things here right so there is uh, there is false there is true which is required and other things so uh, this is a very important uh, very important uh, action item so just take a look at it as well when you are deploying through github actions um, so let me go back and uh, so I have everything. So what I'm doing here is I'm building all the uh, all the code. Uh, this is these are four different build uh, build commands, which is there. Build and push to my registry, which is out there, and it is obviously building it and pushing it. So basically, we will make some changes to the code, and we will see uh, those change. So if I go to to app, I have. Uh, to do app at reactor Bengaluru instead of that, let's say to do app for Azure Kubernetes day, right? So let's do that and save this. So when I save this, what do I need to do? So I need to, where am I in the repos? Yes, GitHub status. There is a change, GitHub add, and then there is GitHub commit. Or GitHub status done. I'm pushing the code to my GitHub. So the code is there now. The code just got pushed into the to do app. So you can see in my to do app there was a change. Um, in the front end 17 seconds ago, but actions won't run um, unless and until uh, we run it, right? So we go to Kubernetes build. I can see we have run it before and now hopefully it will run. So it is it is manual trigger. I haven't, I haven't said that uh, it will be a, you know, uh, on push. So it is going to be a manual trigger. So I'm doing it a manual trigger because I was doing a bunch of things. So I just do not want it to have a, this thing so let it let it go uh trigger and we will see we will wait for it to run because it's it's going to take some time to deploy while it is deploying it is you know you can see here it, it was building the code for a database api right now so it is it will take some time to build all the code and push it to registry and stuff while it is happening so let me spend some time uh, because of the time constraint we have uh, let me some spend some time on the uh, monitoring system and the uh, policies which you can enable so it's very simple so, so if you if you open see the uh, communities cluster and if you just go below there is specifically a section for monitoring and if you go into insights uh, you can see cluster level information uh, node level information uh, controller level. So if you see the cluster level information, you can see what is the usage. Uh, you can also see the memory utilization of the cluster and node count, uh, how many nodes we have, uh, and then active pod counts, number of active pod counts running as probably an average count or something. So it's basically it is uh, it's an information uh, center, right? Insights. So basically you go and look into it, and also you can see list of containers which is running and what is what is the status of that and you know, various things, uh, you can figure it out. And, you know, the most important thing is, is also about alerts. So I have built an alert and it is showing me a warning. So what it means is, uh, there is, there is an increase in pod, pod number. So I have set up something like if there are more pods getting created beyond certain number, send me an alert. So that is, that is what it is showing me. 
and it is very easy to create how do you create see if you see it's been a long time the average number of pod in ready state is more so it is getting triggered so how do i create this so go and just click on add rule and you can just create a new rule here so you can select which resource you are creating you can set up the conditions uh, it will show you a couple of conditions uh, i have selected this uh, so there are 25 pods but it is in the dimension namespace in the pod equals to to do app so if i select the to do app it is 8.3 right so it is showing me average number of pods which is running uh, from last five minutes so greater than total number uh, you can say something number you can give and then run it so i have that's what i have done so i have, i'm getting an alert now so i'll be getting an emails uh, where do I get emails? So I'll be I, I can create those actions here, add action groups and uh, click on the action group and you'll see there is a couple of actions which you can set up and uh, you know run through with this. Right. So there is alert rule as well. So you can set up the rule, uh, which is just very similar to what we have done from an action group. You will be creating a name for this and running it. So action, in, in action group, you can set up whether you want to an SMS, email, or what it is. And uh, that is what it means. OK, so you have alerts. You have you know things to uh, do and metrics. Again, it, it provides you the metrics where you can spend uh, telemetry uh, information. It provides the container pod. And you can choose pod count and other things. And you can see there is many things you can select here um, and run through it. So it has a couple of things, diagnosis settings and uh, logs. Um, again, log, log is, again, it was written on query language uh, kqueries. And uh, you can run a couple of uh, log uh, queries and get logs and uh, container logs, stream it, uh, stream as per your need, right? So this is how you can uh, set it up and uh, use monitoring system as well. I'll spend some time on the policies as well. Um, so policies uh, is very important when, when it comes to making sure that you have the compliance and other things. So here is, here is a policy uh, where you can go to the policies and uh, just enable this policies structure on top of this and go to the Azure policies and you will see couple of, uh, you know, it will tell you whether it is compliant or not compliant, where it where you are missing. I have not assigned any policy, but you can assign. If you click on the assign policy and select a couple of policy definitions, which is available, there are a bunch of definitions uh, for, you know, especially uh, probably, you know, if you search for Kubernetes, it is 49 policies, which is there. So you, you can see that, you know, there are certain policies you can add on top of this cluster. And if this is not met, it will start showing you there is a compliance issue of this uh, cluster. So this is a very interesting one. And it is required from a security perspective and from an audit and various things. And you need to go up through uh, different policies and see which one is uh, suitable for your uh, execution, right? So that is something which is obviously there. And there is custom built. So there is custom built as well. So uh, you should be looking at the custom uh, policies as well. You can also build one. So this is about policies, monitoring, and other things. We'll see what happened to the code, which we did, um, which we ran on the GitHub. So it has built. It has deployed the code. So we'll go to the what happened to the code here. So whether it is OK, it is reloading. So this is, this is how. Uh, code is uh, built and deployed. So I don't do anything. So it's a simple code change. And after that, GitHub Actions, I set up the GitHub Actions. I just push the code and it is already in the uh, production. So so if you see the overall, right? So I was able to build a cluster so easily. And I can also use Terraforms to provision. So I have the code, but uh, from because, because of the time, I cannot show you. But there is Terraform code as well. So here it's it's about setting up uh, the plan and uh, you know basically where is the Terraform? Okay, this is the Terraform code. So this is the you know provider which we have and setting up the provider and storing of the state of the Terraform in the uh, storage of 
you know Azure account and uh, I'm storing there and then uh, obviously I'm using the uh, resource which is uh, Kubernetes RM resource but if you see here the yeah, I've you know set up the complete uh, Azure uh, resource you know provider uh, to run this and then you can see there is a couple of definitions I can create and create that so I can also manage this through uh, Terraform. So there is a support for uh, Terraform to build uh, and provision your infrastructure for communities. And there is a GitHub Actions to run these seamlessly. And there is a support for a monitoring system in, in place. And there is a policies and control plane is managed by uh, Azure uh, communities. So overall, you know, you can uh, build and deploy your applications very easily uh, if you're using the managed services and you know more things so i'll i'll just spend uh, five more minutes before i deep dive into five minutes of uh, questions so this is uh, the um, you know cloud skills challenge uh, which i have um, for uh, this specific uh, you know azure kubernetes day so you know it's basically uh, I have handpicked this workshop for people. You know, it's, if I have to go here and show you this cloud skill challenge itself, so so you need to join the challenge. Uh, that is one thing. So I am not joining. I haven't. I have already joined. So because I was in incognito mode, let me go open it here. Okay. So I've, in fact, I have completed it. So just go here. So this is a module, and this is Elastic module as well. If you are if you are looking at uh, building something with Elastic on Kubernetes, how to do it? I've also added that module as well. And by the way, if you see this Elastic Kubernetes service, so if you click on Elastic Kubernetes uh, service workshop, it's completely having. Uh, you know, basically, if you run through this, let me show you this. Uh, okay, so. What this covers is uh, not just creating Kubernetes cluster, but also how to uh, work with it uh, from you know, managing it to building it and deploying it, uh, especially the microservice application, which is out there. So uh, if I have to show you the introduction part of it, uh, if you see this, uh, this is the architecture which you will learn. So it has you know, certification, you know, certificate managers, ingress management, uh, you can see monitoring system, Azure Container Registry, how to work with it, and how these APIs in cluster work in, in terms of uh, just exposing a couple of pods and other things. So it, it provides you the complete uh, workshop. It's just a two hours workshop. Just go through that and complete that so that you can make use of uh, this, uh, if through this learn module for your learning purpose. It has code, so play with the code. Uh, and most importantly, I just wanted to show you was this, uh, which gives you a sandbox. In fact, it gives you a sandbox where you can go back and build uh, your application, right? So this is um, this is something which I just wanted to spend time on. Just go back and be part of it. Uh, let me keep this up. And while I am here. I'm happy to take questions. If there is any questions, uh, I have five minutes. Uh, I can see uh, Renu is already here. So let me spend some time on the questions. If there is any questions, uh, there are questions. Hi, sir. Let me do this. Bring this up. Hi, sir. Is it possible to increase the audio or keep the mic a little near? You can't hear me. Is it that bad? I'm not sure. OK. Let me bring this up. Post the link. Yes, it will be posted. GitHub link, I will post it. Um, OK, there is some couple of things. Any questions? This is a cloud skill challenge, by the way. So I just want to bring in that link. Uh, let me post that link as well. Let me post this link for you. 
for people who are asking for Can you give me more uh, more insight on what is the push command you're talking about? Is it GitHub push? Push comment on GitHub, on Azure portal, or GitHub push. Can you show a command, city command you use to deploy? Okay, so let me show that. I know it's basically, uh, 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 uh. so what is the command which I use? What is the command? What is the command I use? So this is a command. So this is a simple command. It's a very, uh, simple command which I used to push the uh, to push the YAML file. So this is one. The other one which you are talking about, um, the the to-do app, if you go to my to-do app uh, GitHub repo as well, so there is a deployment file here, right? So I, all I need to do is change this command which I showed you to uh, deployment.yaml. So I just change this. So it's all about just using this manifestation file. So that's all. So any more questions? I don't need to dip. I don't need to. Uh, okay, there's a question on whether I need to delete it. No, I don't need to delete it. So I just need to uh, reapply and it will just make sure that it is uh, if there are things changed in the manifestation it will make changes to that otherwise it will just keep that manifestation uh, it will tell you whether it is deployed or not deployed uh, let me go back here cool I have two more minutes uh, before I bring in uh, Renu for I know the bridge to Kubernetes uh, amazing uh, tool. Uh, if I am a developer, I need, definitely need that tool. Um, there is a question uh, saying what is orchestration in DevOps? So not sure. Like what is the what do you mean by uh, orchestration in DevOps? So. That is something which I just want to understand as well. If you have any insight, can you please share that? I have. Oh, there is some question. OK, let me show this here. I have seen some cache uh, will be there in pod if you do direct apply instead of deleting. Is there something? Else? Yes, it will, it will be there. So it is based on the deployment strategy, right? So. Uh, the pods will not die as soon as you just do the deployment. It will verify whether this particular uh, pod is ready or not. When it is, when one of the pod is ready, the new version of the pod is ready. The old version of the pod is still there. Uh, it stays for 30 seconds and it is also sometimes you can also set it, set your own uh, time as well. You can make those changes in the uh, cluster uh, you can say this this is the amount of time I want by default it is 30 seconds so it is going to be there and it, it should also you know make sure that all the already available request has to be served so that is the reason it, it still stays there but uh, eventually it dies There are certain, you know, yeah, that's a good question. Like, is there any tool to build uh, YAMLs and other things? But yes, um, you know, there are certain tools which is there in the market, but I would definitely use the Visual Studio and just build it. Yeah, the, I mean, that's a... Uh, you know, this is an interesting question. Like, if I just want to validate setup, 
locally and that is why you know you need to use the bridge to Kubernetes. Again, I'm going to bring in Renu now. Uh, I'm just going to bring her in so that you know she can give you an insight on why you should be using it. And this is one of the reasons as well, like you have the setup ready and, and you just need to use those setup. So let me bring Renu here um, before I... I know you're there, you're live. Yeah, oh, thank you, Vivek. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, Who are you? Yeah, doing good. Doing good. Uh, I'm sorry, might be some background noise at my end. Uh, there is some construction going on on the upper flat. So, no worries. So sorry about that. No worries. So, uh, uh, just to, uh, for the audience, just to introduce Renu here as an uh, Renu comes with you know 15 years of experience, and you know uh, she is having a knowledge of all the things with cloud computing. She's you know she works on day to day in uh, with a lot of things, very advanced things like the bridge to Kubernetes, very advanced ones which I cannot do it. So and there is um, you know obviously uh, she is a senior software engineer at Microsoft. She works at commercial software engineering team. Um, so welcome, Renu. Um, I will, you know, hand over uh, the mic to you. In fact, so if you are an in-person event, it would be like a mic to you. <laughs> so, so just take take over and uh, give us, uh, you know, insight into bridge to communities and how it works and stuff like that. And I will definitely moderate questions and I will uh, definitely ask you some questions as well because I have a couple of questions too. So. Go ahead. Uh, sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, as a developer, uh, so first of all, reason for this talk is uh, as I'm a developer and uh, I can see so many developer in uh, uh, in the ID industry and everyone is like keen, if I have developed something, can I run that code as is into production? Like I need not to sync anything on my local. So that's the bare minimum requirement. So this request was coming from various communities uh, so many developers so as a microsoft what we did we have tried to build a plugin for visual studio code as well as visual studio and uh, through which you can uh, do everything uh, that uh, you need for development but it is in sync of your production environment on kubernetes so uh, that's why let me quickly share my screen Um, uh, is it visible? Yeah. So uh, as you can see, header of the talk is all about how you can run and debug your code on local machine while your production code is already on AKS. So that is going to be focused for today. So let's first talk about few of the developer ask as I gave you brief that this was the very frequent request from various developer communities. So first of all, as a developer, our basic need is how fast we can build and test our code. So all the cycles that we do have, like uh, my peers are working on some different modules, but still I need to work on my module and it has dependency on other things. Having keep all these dependencies in mind still, I how can I build my code fast? How can I test it? It, it is not only about the unit test, integration test and other tests as well. And in case of any bug or you know normal debug cycle, how fast I can run this? So this is one basic ask. Apart from this, what if there are a number of ap application which are growing in my environment? So I'm working on one uh, specific module tomorrow what about if there are 10 modules which will be coming into system and my application need to interact with everyone. So how can I uh, handle the scaling of the app in my particular environment? Another is as frequent as development environment is, you know, changing. So by change, it can be anything like, as I said, the application are growing. So one application could be of .NET, another could be of Java, third one could be of any third platform. So if I'm running or working on my app on Node environment, so can I still use 
features of those applications irrespective of their technology and uh, handle that agility and the last one is with keeping all the complications in mind my main aim should be it should be easy to use so as complication grow in terms of number of application and different cycles of the software engineering or uh, the tech stack but it should be easy to manage as well as it should be easy to handle by each and every developer so as developer they have expertise in their own specific area so they need not to hunt for something new something different just for their managing complexity so rather just focus on your own environment on development so that is the basic ask and i think that's very fair because as a developer this is our basic need so what are the various approaches that we can opt for this so our code in kubernetes is deployed on a cloud so it's not on my local but still i need to connect to or i need to be in sync with all the code which is already there in the production and i need to do my development so there are three different ways i can handle it one is let me first take replica of everything which is there in aks host it on my machine and connect with it and then start my coding debugging everything second option is can i have something like the replica of few services on my machine on which i'm directly connecting but most of other services which is on my code is not directly dependent for example if i'm working in a hr department for me a direct interest could be of like financial services data so let me host that service on my local but if financial service application is dependent on any third application let it be on cloud so it's a kind of remote so half code on my local half on cloud and let's see so this is a uh, hybrid and uh, for completely remote is let everything on the cloud uh, and uh, so i need to make each and every change in my code so i need to make all the configuration all the connection string everything let let me make it change on my local machine and then let it connect to kubernetes so that's the third one option so if i compare all the three the first one is like in the local one so if i have everything on, on my local machine then anyway my build my test everything is going to fast because i i have everything on local but in terms of the deployment environment or the scalability of application so in case there is one more application coming into picture or there is a new patch coming into production environment every time i need to go i need to download that or i need to take a backup copy and install on my local machine so it's an overhead so i am rather than i'm focusing on my own code on my own module i will be mostly spending time on this infrastructure thing like getting the code deploying it and let's again make some configuration changes on my local machine those things are the bare minimum requirement that i need to do for uh, my local deployment let's talk about if everything is on remote so in that scenario what we generally do uh, we uh, always try to keep a configuration file in which i will try to have some connection string of the remote services and then try to connect with them so in this way because those are the connection strings those are remote so anyway my build test cycle those are going to be very slow so there there could be an issue in that but i need not to download or get sync with the production environment every time because i'm not maintaining any duplicate copy on my local machine so always the dependencies uh, applications or the code that is always latest only thing is i'm going to change my connection string but it is not a good experience for testing and um, debugging cycle and third one is again uh, since there may be many issues connecting with the remote so it's not any way easy to use so now third option is that the hybrid one so let's write code on local machine and all the things which is already there in the kubernetes how can i quickly connect without having anything else on my local so without changing any configuration what if we do have that option like i will be just working on my code and while running just a another run kind of button that will say okay let's try to connect with the kubernetes services in which you have all your dependencies so i'm not going to download 
any local code for other applications. So if that is possible, then anyway, I can run all the test cases, all the debug cycle, all the build cycles on my local machine very quickly, very fast. And if there is any new application going on uh, or getting deployed in AKS, I need not to bother about that because it will be always in sync. I'm directly getting connected to that. And uh, Glass is it's easy to use because I'm not making any configuration change in my code on my local machine. So those are the very easily uh, defined benefit if I can opt for a hybrid one. But now question is how we can have that hybrid environment. So answer is bridge to Kubernetes. So as name says, it's a kind of bridge which will be uh, getting created between your Kubernetes environment and your uh, local machine. And in demonstration, I'll show you how that's actually happening. Now, let's talk about the concept. What will be happening? So you have three different, uh, uh, I would say, application. One is your web application. Third is your own version of the code in which you are working. And third is your third application or your third dependency, which is already on the cloud. So initially, there are three cloud applications. One is your best sharing for example, bike sharing web that is interacting with the bike app. And that's the actual portion of your app on which you are working or you can say your module on Can you hear me? You can hear me, uh, Reno? We just lost you for some minute. Yeah, Vivek, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you. I think I lost you again. Yeah, now we can hear you. But your video is frozen, I believe. Maybe you can switch off your cam and probably you can. Yeah, now it is fine. One second, let me switch off my camera. That could be the issue. One second. My machine got hung. So <laughs> I'm not sure it's docking station or what. <laughs> ah. Can you still see my screen? I can see the screen, um, but I think it is stuck. OK. Now it is fine. Really. OK, let me switch off my camera. OK, and let me share it again. Hopefully, it should be fine now. So that's the magic of uh, remote conference, not the in-person. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted to be sure that you know, no such issue happens so I'm, with, I'm at office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, so, you know, working from home. Yeah. Let me add that into the stream. Just give me a minute. Yeah. Now yeah. it's maybe, yeah, now it's fine. Yeah. OK, so I'm not sure till when I was able to communicate. One is like three modules on one is your local machine. And um, in case uh, like bridge to Kubernetes, what does it do? So when you hit the URL of your application, it will start routing the traffic of the specific module on your local machine. And then uh, the third application, if my module is dependent on, again, it will getting read out directly to the cloud 
cloud. So all the three application, only one for one specific module, uh, my traffic is getting redirected to my local machine, rest is on cloud and uh, traffic is as is. Uh, so there is no difference. So that's the basic concept that we are trying to use while using the bridge to Kubernetes. So it's a kind of traffic routing that you can think of. Now, what are the features or, uh, you know, key features for this bridge to Kubernetes? One is uh, it is very simple for the microservice deployment. As you could see, there were three different modules. And if two modules are on three, all three are on cloud on one specific on which I am doing development, I need to redirect. So I have these like different, different services, only one service on which I'm working. I will have this on my local machine. Rest is uh, so very simple for the microservice kind of environment. and uh, it's very easy to debug because I can easily put a debug point on my local and then when uh, traffic will be getting routed from the URL, it will come to me and I can see all the logs. I can debug it uh, step by steps. And third one is as uh, all the development as well as testing I can do end to end. It's not like only the unit testing I can perform on my local machine because it's a full flash system. It has already created a bridge between two different environment, your development as well as your uh, uh, Kubernetes environment. So let's take a scenario. So this is uh, an sample app which has a front end and um, the if any request is coming to front end with the API gateway, it is getting routed to two different uh, uh, APIs. So one is like stats API, which is you can think of if you want to uh, get uh, some statistics around your current application, how many, uh, you know, sales we have done or how, what are the budget for this? So all the stats of your current environment or you have a kind of reporting application. So one API is for that, that is in the end getting uh, connected with the RabbitMQ via service, that's a stats worker. Another uh, kind of request that is getting routed is via the catalog. So it's a kind of another uh, uh, service uh, which is getting connected to the Cosmos. So there you can see different applications, different platform. One is your RabbitMQ, another is your Cosmos DB. And these APIs that is like sets API or database API, this could be in any language like your, um, if you can think of your Java, .NET or any other whichever you feel comfortable. And all these things are deployed on your Kubernetes services. So this is a very simple scenario, multiple technology and uh, multiple tech stacks and uh, getting deployed into Kubernetes. In this scenario, what if you need to do some kind of uh, uh, debugging? And uh, let me uh, quickly share my uh, code window. So, uh, so this is a sample app um, the, in which what is happening, uh, it is having two different, uh, basically multiple modules. Let me first show you the app so that it will be easy for you to correlate. So I have deployed uh, bike app and you can get this app uh, from uh, GitHub. I'll share all the steps with you, how can we, you can get it deployed. So once you have this app deployed and you can see this is on Kubernetes and uh, I'm just hitting the URL. Let me first log out for this user. So this is the home page. So home page of Adventure Work Cycles and I have two different customer. I can log in with anyone and this is, you know, the way I can choose which bike I want to rent, what's the hourly rate and so. So if I select one and uh, this is the page i can rent it i can uh, then i can return the bike so you can see this is all front end what's very simple but behind the screen it is having multiple services so if i'll switch to the code so there you can see uh, so in this we do have multiple application like some uh, web app which is being there a specific app which is just handling or specific module i would say not the app that is handling all the, the reservation system and uh, one specific module is for the gateway 
this is the web this is the gateway this is the reservation and one is handling all the assets in terms of the bike so how many bikes do we have and there you can see this is the code for the bike app bike sharing app in which uh, i do have number of rest apis through which it is trying to um, get data of the bikes and display it on the front end. And in similar way, if I'm going to add something new, uh, then th these APIs are exposed for that. In similar way, I can delete a bike or so. And you can see image URL is also coming from that app. Now question is how you can configure or from where you can get this, you know, uh, well, the specific, uh, plugin so one is you just go here and look for the bridge for kubernetes and this is bridge for kubernetes you just need to install it so once you install so what will happen if i'll switch back you just need to press Control shift p then this option will be coming for you so bridge to kubernetes configure so for this as a prerequisite you need to uh, first have a kubernetes environment on azure let me first show you that as well so i do have a cluster with name aks days this is my cluster and uh, every configuration with this plugin like kubernetes uh, plugin you can see here and i have i do have different namespace so for me bike app is the main namespace in which i do have everything and uh, you can see this is the basic uh, YAML file for my uh, uh, bike app namespace. And uh, there are multiple services which are getting deployed and one service that is exposed for my web APIs. And when I hit that URL, you could see uh, this is the actual URL in which it is getting connected to my app, which is hosted on Kubernetes. So this is my kubernetes cluster in which i do have multiple namespace and once i i have installed bridge to kubernetes extension so what it will do when i will try to configure this so it it's a four-step process first it will try to choose a service uh, looks like i need to rest update it's depend updating some dependencies so i think let me close this and open it again. So it's a VM, not a high end. So that's why a few issues with this. So it will uh, load the namespace. Meanwhile, uh, uh, OK, it's still installing some updating the dependencies when I hit uh, for configuration and then it will give me uh, so behind the screen it will try to connect with all the AKS cluster that you have configured as I show you, showed you and then it will retrieve all the services so by default I do have only one cluster and uh, for that uh, these are the services which are exposed and you can see this is a gateway reservation bike for my interest office bikes because i'm already working on that specific module so i will say okay i'm going to use this service for which i'm doing a local development so once i have selected this then it will ask for the port okay on your local machine on which port you are going to run your application so for my application this is 3000 and i will say okay and then it will ask for okay which configuration are you going to run with npn so I will say yes, local is going to buy my NPN. Then this is the critical step. And why critical, I'll also tell you. So one thing is, if what if all the users who are going to use your, uh, uh, the, your, your the big app on um, like Adventure Cycle app, and they are going to hit the URL. So do you want everyone to get redirect to your local code? If yes or not. So if you want everyone to get redirect, then click no. And if you want specific request that is coming only from your machine, that's why you can see this is my username for this machine. And then some uh, character it has added and then saying, okay, if request is coming from this particular subdomain, only redirect 
than to my local machine. Otherwise, let everyone get redirected to the actual production environment or your cloud environment. So I'm going to say, okay, only redirect the request which is coming only from my machine. So once I have selected it, uh, in the bottom, it is going to set all the configuration uh, for this plugin. And um, once that is done, now technically it will start redirecting the traffic to my local machine and to run my code i need to go to run and debug and there i would see another option that is launch via npn with kubernetes so once you are going to hit this your local npn will start and uh, it will start redirecting the traffic or of the cloud and if that cloud is having any reference of uh, the bike app, then it will start sending to you, to your local machine. And this is, um, uh, th this is the basic thing that you need to keep in mind because it is the port to port communication. Sometime, uh, most of the time it will ask for your permission. Can you, uh, or like this uh, plugin is going to update uh, your uh, host machine or Kubernetes cluster, do you want to, allow this i will say continue and if i'll allow but i think there uh, i think i need to restart it again because i had not started my visual studio code um, as an admin i need to because th that need admin permission to give or use the port for uh, port forwarding so i'm going to run it again Otherwise, it will fail. It will not going to run. And when I will again say uh, run and debug my code and it should be on Kubernetes, I will say, OK, run it on Kubernetes. Hit the run button. Then uh, let me uh, show you all the logs. So what is happening? It is trying to find the target service. So current namespace is bike app in which service which is going to use is bikes and the port is 3000 on my local machine and now it is trying to establish a connection uh, with the namespace and try to get the port detail agent detail so everything it will get and now you can see connection has been established so now this orange thing you can see Okay, it's gone, like some issue on my machine looks like. So otherwise, when your bar is going to be orange, it's mean it is fully functional up and running. And once it's up and running, and when you will start sending or when you will start hitting the code on your local machine, like hitting the URL from your local machine, and when you will try to uh, hit this URL, it will stop here because I have put a breakpoint. So my breakpoint is on this. So it will stop here. Let me try to run it again. Okay, it is trying to establish a connection. Validating credential of the cluster. And there you can see one critical thing is it is going to replicate the resource locally. So I, I have not done that, but this plugin will automatically re, uh, replicate all the resources on your local environment. And then that's how you are getting the feel that everything is on your local. And I'm not going to make any configuration in my code, but it will uh, do everything for me. So that's the way this configuration works. Somehow it's not working as on today. But let, uh, let's move forward and uh, uh, let's talk about how th this configuration i have told you and you just need to put the breakpoint it will start debugging but as a next step what's happening so one is behind the screen first of all as i have shown you it will prompt you for the configuration so what is your cluster which service you want to get connect which is your port so these are the basic thing as it is was asking for the port so it's basically doing a kubectl port forward on your de development machine. So that's the command or the power of Kubernetes it is using for that. And it will replace the, uh, so in Kubernetes, it will uh, it will replace or create a new uh, pod specifically for your specific module. 
and there it will host that so whenever a request will be coming for example renu hyphen some digit then it will know okay this is the local um, environment so i need not to redirect uh, the api to the cloud i need to send it to local machine so it's a kind of on the pod level it will do uh, it will use the pod forwarding and send it to my local so that's one thing another is as uh, i i was showing you it is it was collecting and replicating all the environment information from the cluster to my local machine so it is do it do and store it on my local machine uh, in a cache and once i stop my instance it will uh, clean all the details and once uh, another is uh, for this as uh, this was for visual studio code in similar way you need to perform the same step for the visual studio if you are opting for visual studio so there you can create your own c sharp application and if you are familiar with that so same kind of setup is required for visual studio another is as uh, you could see it was asking for the permission for the port so because for port forwarding and uh, internally it is going to use my host uh, you know with the ports so that's why it always try to update that host file in which we do have all the detail of the port which can be exposed to the external environment so that's where you need to have admin permission on your local machine or you need to have those uh, rights uh, or credential to uh, uh, modify those host file and uh, last is uh, you can start running and debugging code from the local machine so so key point is it internally use uh, port forwarding it first replicate the code it create a new port in which uh, it use port forwarding to getting traffic redirected to the local machine and it's also try to retain a local copy on your local environment without your in intervention it's totally done by the plugin so let's see how does it work in the isolation so isolation is like as i said i don't want every traffic to be routed to my code it's only if i'm running uh, or i'm hitting this url only then it should get redirect so that's the scenario so there you can see for bikes is has created a local version for that in kubernetes and uh, then there are three different uh, or two other services one is john is working on uh, reservation system so his own local version is there mine local version is there so once i will hit this uh, url then it will see okay the subdomain from which request is coming is on this renu machine so not redirect this to bike let it redirect to the bike renu local version and then for further step it will again redirect to the cloud so this is a kind of isolation or you know segregation of the environment that happens so and for more detail you can see this is the flow it's a ingress in which you could see that was renu hyphen 123 something and the service name so if someone is uh, so i was hitting that uh, url it will automatically clone it i will it will add my initials and send to service a and then as i have i have already told you it will do all the required steps and whenever required it will redirect uh, the traffic to my local machine my dev machine and again it will go back to the for the next service and uh, that's how the flow will happen now thing is uh, what are the additional configuration that you may need to do uh, to make it run so sometime uh, uh, if you want to have uh, like if you want to store the token information or some secrets on your local machine you need to have those details as well and uh, you can override kubernetes configuration uh, uh, strongly so if there is uh, you know database which is connected to the cloud environment but you don't want to connect to that if you want to get it redirected to the some other database or you want to override those configuration so these are the basic uh, configuration that you need to do in similar way you can change uh, uh, the api versions or you know other namespace that is as and when required so you can easily get those information from the plugin site and Another is what are the known limitation for this? So one is uh, as it was replicating the pod, so that's why a pod can have only single container to be running. 
so that's uh, limitation as on today because this is designed in the way that it is going to replicate the pod and that's why B bridge for kubernetes uh, uh, this this basically work on the pod level another is as of now you can't have your windows container to configure bridge for kubernetes it's only supporting the linux one and um, it was asking for some permission to modify your host file that's why you need to have uh, permission on your development environment to uh, a kind of admin permissions for some settings and uh, another is uh, there are few uh, another limitation is you can't use uh, uh, it on cluster uh, the cluster which is having as your dev space enabled so you always need to disable it only then you can use that kubernetes cluster to get plug in or to be used by bridge for kubernetes uh, so those are uh, known limitation for that and uh, let's uh, take some question uh, because only we have only some time and somehow uh, that uh, my code was not able to connect it got failed somewhere but i'll record a demo then i can send it again no worries so um, you know uh, there is one question uh, you know uh, i'm just posting it on the screen yeah. So it's basically how do I use the database? So if I have a production database and I'm mm -hmm. I'm using uh, to run a couple of uh, tests, uh, mm -hmm. how I don't want to insert some some records into production database. So if I have this specific thing running, so how do I manage that? Uh, for, see, uh, if I'm doing some development anyway, I'm not going to connect to develop uh, product prod environment. So for this my database that is going to be connected on the local uh, or my uh, development database or my staging database whatever we use so that's my own code setting but for other settings like a request will be coming to my uh, my module it will be inserting data to the uh, local uh, database or the staging database then it will getting redirected to the another one like and if it is having dependencies on other modules database first of all it should be independent so if it is having some database dependencies so it's always recommended that uh, the environment like if you do have dev environment most of we do have dev, dev environment and that then dev environment does not mean my local machine this dev environment is my aks dev environment in that aks uh, dev environment we we are anyway we are going to have all the dev databases not the production database so in that case my application or my local module that will be pointed to the local or the dev database and uh, at the every floor every other application that is in that those are point getting pointed to the same database so this was uh, it's not like a hybrid in terms of it's not recommended that you are doing development on a production environment so if you are uh, debugging your code on local then always try to that connect with the look uh, your development uh, aks instance if something has been moved from your development environment then it moved to staging or your test environment and you know all the dev policies uh, dev cycles so if something has been approved in that dev environment only then it is going to staging and staging is something you can't change so that's not recommended that you make a replica of your staging environment or prod environment on your local machine those are a kind of uh, isolated untouched environment so so it's basically uh, not to be used in production environments so the the best practice to use bridge to communities is to use it in uh, your dev and test environments where you are basically developing something and you're pushing something and checking uh, what's happening you don't have to uh, always have to download all the services instead you connect your to the cluster where you're running dev uh, specific dev environments right so that is that is the use case of uh, bridge to communities by the way so any any other questions uh, from the audience uh, as well so uh, you know just from my understanding so when when you create uh, when we run this bridge to communities when i configure it and when i launch it through debug uh, does it create uh, pods on my uh, on on my cluster yeah can you please repeat 
uh, when I when I when I do this bridge to Kuma, you know Kubernetes when mm-hmm. I do, you know run the debug uh, mm-hmm. after configuring it, does it create mm-hmm. extra pods on the uh, cluster so that it it has more cluster you know more pods uh, created so that you can connect to those yeah. pods right that is through that through yes. port forwarding that is coming through port from port to port connection. The, yes the, yes okay. that's why uh, that's why it is uh, as i said it's a kind of uh, working behind the screen one uh, pod is having only one container that's why you, when you were configuring it it was asking specifically for which service you want to have it and there it is going to make a replica of that pod so got it that's a yeah. part of configuration yeah Any other question from the audience? Um, we 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 still have five minutes. Um, okay, there is a question. Uh, so basically, somebody is asking for uh, GitHub link as well. Mm-hmm. So you can share it with me. You know, I can share it with the you know, with the audience. And there is a question basically. Uh, is there a way to enable and disable certain specific machines for deployment? Uh, not sure what, what is that. Um, can you just elaborate what you mean by specific machines for deployment? So if uh, so, um, if that is related to like uh, getting like one, the basic thing is uh, not deployment because Bridge for Kubernetes is not doing any kind of deployment. It is just about the development that you can do. It routing the traffic to your local machine. So if you mean to say the specific machine uh, gets stopped for uh, redirecting traffic to your local machine, so there is only either one or all. So either only i can have uh, the traffic getting routed to my local machine or let other developers also to start routing traffic to my local machine so it's not like half users can redirect or uh, you know only few it's like all the use either all the users getting redirected to the mo- my local machine or none of them only me only two options by the way this is the link you can take a look at it if you want to go back and look at it. Cool. So we have one more minute. Uh, we will wait for some more questions to come for a minute. Otherwise, uh, OK, there is one more question. Let's take this one. Renu is on the screen. So it says, uh, so this is extra pod gets created behind the scene. A local code on cluster, is that true? Yes, it is true. That is what I asked. <laughs> yeah yes that's true so yeah, one so it's basically uh, going to create more pods in the background yes yeah one pod uh, for your uh, own module in which on which you are working basically the traffic getting routed yes. so one extra pod and if there are n number like five de- developer who are working on different modules and uh, they are using bridge for kubernetes then five different pod for each of their own instance Cool. Okay, Reno, I'll let you go and have a nice weekend. <laughs> thank you for uh, joining in and thank you for this wonderful session. And uh, let me bring in Vishal. Vishal is here. Let me bring in. Hey, Vishal. Hey, hi. Can you hear me? Okay. All good. I can hear you. All good. Perfect. Perfect. How are you doing, Vivek? I'm doing great. How was your morning? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good so far. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, for the audience, you know, I just want to introduce uh, Vishal. Um, you know, Vishal is uh, CTO of uh, Infra Cloud Technologies, and uh, he is an enthusiast for transforming a lot of businesses onto Kubernetes. I've heard a lot of good stories of <laughs> things from Vishal. So that's something which we are going to discuss as well. And uh, he's been a contributor to uh, Fission Project, which is a serverless uh, Fission Project. And he 
he does own the communities and cnc of meetup at uh puna puna right it's it's in puna mm-hmm. and you know i know vijay from it like he he writes a lot about uh the books he reads on twitter uh i've seen him uh seen him on you know doing some himalayan trips right you you, you did you did Himal- <laughs> somewhere right trips yeah, in himalayan just, just right? for covid <laughs> yeah that's yeah. that's what uh, that's what vishal is so i'm just introducing you uh, to the audience so welcome vishal uh, to the Thank azure you. community today um and i know i just want to go back uh, while i was having a discussion with you uh, yesterday or last week as well so um, I, i'm just going back to our days of uh, you know the hcl and you know where we used to discuss pre pre docker era pre communities era where you know we were talking about uh, how do we use this ansible and various other things to build and deploy stuff and all those things right. so i just wanted to i mean i'm curious to ask you this question so uh, is what was your first you know first experience you know what what did you feel when you started uh, with the uh, docker when you packaged your first uh you know first code from a docker or a container technology and deployed it on kubernetes right so what was your uh, you know you know basically what was your feeling you know how how did it feel for you because we all were using it uh using the uh you know the normal ones the packaging ones we you know you remember those days right so <laughs> how how does you feel yeah it's it, it's interesting you ask about that question because i was just thinking yesterday you know uh early 2010s uh, we had things like you know uh, google app engine cloud foundry the pass platforms you know of the day basically right and then ansible uh, saw chef puppet you know kind of became the dominant open source tools to build and package and you know manage maybe virtual machines you know many of them together and then when docker came i think it was very very magical you could you could run two different completely you know isolated things on the same machine without having to interfere with each other but interestingly for me i actually did not start with kubernetes you know in my journey you know of of containerization i actually worked with mesos uh, you know before kubernetes and i was super impressed you know with what mesos was doing uh, the way it was running containers uh, and it was also running you know a lot of big data workloads like hadoop uh, spark uh, we had a kafka cluster and bunch of those things right and i thought you know mesos is going to be the dominant you know container orchestration platform you know back in the day right and and i was still fairly you know kind of watching kubernetes from the sidelines basically uh luckily you know i i got a next uh work that i worked with a customer you know pretty close to kubernetes got very deep into it and then i realized you know the power of the open source the community and and you know giving you the right abstraction so that you can you know build up to up to your own needs or requirements basically so docker was definitely very very magical uh you know coming from the background of chef and puppet and you know those things uh kubernetes or mesos were kind of logical next steps for scale i would say but yeah uh, you know i i thought mesos will win the race but here we are you know with kubernetes probably the most dominant orchestration platform out there now <laughs> perfect so yeah i mean there were a lot of bunch of uh, orchestration tools which were in the race yeah. and mm-hmm. uh, definitely kubernetes uh, won the race there um right. you know some of these questions which i'm going to ask you now is go is the collection of those uh, questions which i have been bombarded and uh, sure. whenever i do the communities uh, sessions uh, there is a different kind of questions which comes in and um so i just want to you know make i've collected all those questions and made sure that you know we'll have a discussion on it and you know hear sure. your perspective around it so one mm-hmm. is the uh, you know obviously the, it's it was monolithic era and there was monolithic applications which was there and uh, mm-hmm. there is microservices which has come in and which is which is the next uh, next uh, architecture patterns right so um so whether if i have to move from monolithic to you know the uh, microservice applications so do i have to uh convert it into a container and use it with the kubernetes or it has to be just you know i can just do a normal microservice and what is the advantage there what is the disadvantage is there uh, can you just give a your perspective on it sure sure uh, yeah i i was kind of slightly i would say uh, traditional view you know on monolithic to microservices and then talk about the tools you know when you switch from monolithic to microservices right uh, any company starting out maybe early days you know first 20 25 30 engineers i would highly recommend don't even think about microservices right it's only too much 
uh, overhead uh, of the operational you know aspects too much overhead of you know team communications and stuff it's all right to start with monolith basically right because if your business is taking off with monolith and then you have enough money to you know probably pay back to technical teams and you know switch to microservices that's all right right but the moment you start with microservices you are starting with an additional overhead of you know management you know and running things basically right and the beautiful part is today we have so many offerings out there you can simply build out a container and you know host it in any of these cloud providers right without having to worry about the orchestration right use those kind of services to start with monolith is what you know i i highly recommend to any team once you have got to some scale and then you start seeing some problems you know team coordinations because you know in the same monolith everybody is trying to get their code in Everybody is trying to manage, you know, their patch or their changes with somebody else's changes. Once those start uh, things start appearing, then I would really seriously think about, you know, microservices. And it doesn't have to be, you know, like one big bank project, you know, where you take one monolith, break it into ten microservices. Right? It could be right. You write the next small microservice in a in a small separate service, right, and let it interact with the main monolith, basically, right. So you start taking chips out of that main, you know, block of monolith. I would say, right, and then let that journey happen slightly gradually, if I have to call it that way. Now coming to microservices. Again, if you're talking about probably you know couple of machines and and you know that is enough to hold you know either your monolith or microservices, you probably don't need you know a very sophisticated machinery like your container orchestration platform, right? Uh, but you know maybe you have started you know going beyond a few machines together basically, right? Or a few deployments altogether. Then I would start thinking you know what is my next uh, six months when your you know growth plan looks like, and based on that choose a orchestration tool, right? And and I have. I have been a fan of you know managed services provided by many cloud providers, which do a very beautiful job probably in the early days, right? Uh, I remember this was probably 2014 or 15. I was talking to a team. They had four microservices running on a couple of machines, and they were like, "Let's introduce Kubernetes." I was like, "No," because then we need to add three nodes just for managing Kubernetes, right? The master part of it, and then two worker nodes, right? Which is kind of very, uh, you know, uh, and and you know, I'm not like I I, li I love technology. But I don't, don't want, to, want to be blown away by just technology, but also look at the business problem, so to speak, right? Yeah. So once you move to you know that scale where you have a couple of machines beyond a couple of machines, uh, maybe five or six, you know, ten microservices, then you can start thinking what is my orchestration layer, right? Kubernetes is a great choice, uh, but it also involves a fairly steep learning curve. It is not like you know you can get everything uh, on day one. Uh, things are getting better, definitely, right? You know, as compared to let's say 2014, 15, 16. There was no one-click button Kubernetes cluster, but today you can go to AKS, EKS, or GKE, click a button, you have your cluster up and running. You don't need to worry about managing master nodes, right? Like three, four years ago, you had to worry about managing master nodes as well as the worker nodes. So things are getting definitely better. And maybe in a few years, I would recommend start from Kubernetes, but today I would recommend maybe not, right? So that's that's my perspective uh, on choosing the right. I lost you, Vishal. We... Yeah, I think there was a small glitch in the last few yeah, seconds. I glitch, hope I should be audible glitch. now. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is audible. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you were. You I, were I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, yeah. you know, further in that yeah, so, and, uh, so yeah. the, the other question, when you know, related question is, you know, um, what is the best practice? Like, if, if I have to move from a monolithic application to uh, a microservice application. I often get asked, "What is the you know best practice? What is the best approach?" Uh, so you have done a couple of transformations for uh, some of your uh, customers. So you know, what approach did you take, and what the, what are those learnings you have? Right. Uh, yeah. So yeah, recently I have worked with a couple of fairly legacy code bases mm -hmm. that have been around you know for at least two decades, and and they are always been built as a monolith, basically, right? Mm -hmm. The first thing we recommended to them is probably shift and lift your monolith as it is into a container orchestration platform. You know, that itself will give you probably sixty percent of benefit of using a. I think again there is a issue. Container orchestration. Uh, Am I audible again? Yeah, you're. I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. So the so the first thing I would say is, you know, if possible, probably lift and shift your monolith into the container organization platform. Let it run. You iron out a few, you know, things uh, that might may not be built for container, you know, uh, itself, sort of speak in the first place, right? Then, uh, you know, as come as I was saying in the earlier approach, right? Maybe the new functionalities that you add 
to start running them as small microservices. I'm losing you. Or functions, you microservices, and let them you know scale as you go uh, through the development process. Okay, there was some glitch. So, <laughs> yeah, network, you know. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, no, it seems okay now. I, I don't know why there are small drops in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now it's okay. I can hear you. Yeah. You there, Vishal? Hello. Can you hear me? You can hear me, Vishal? Yeah, am I? Yeah, I can hear there, you. Yeah, there was some glitch and your screen was hung. So okay. So you you were talking about lift and shift, and then mm -hmm. we lost you. Okay. Yeah, I was saying you know first lift and shift iron out all the issues that will have to be worked out in the container world, and then maybe the new functionality we add you can probably add in a separate microservice or a smaller functions alongside Monolith, and then you know. Within monolith also, I just start maybe adding new features. That time you take out smaller, smaller pieces of that uh, monolith and break them into microservices, right? So let it grow very organically. You don't have to like you know this is monolith. These are twenty microservices. You know simply go from here to there, right? That might cause a lot of architectural changes. That might open a lot of can of worms that were you know because. Today we have a lot of technical garage. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm gonna try switching my uh, Wi-Fi provider. Just give me one second, yeah. Yeah. While we are there, there was some questions. So for audience, you know, you can uh, please ask your questions in the chat so that I can uh, spend that we can spend like last ten minutes on the questions from the audience. So keep posting your questions, so I'll bring it up. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you for the suggestion for, you know, we need to have different alternative network connections, true, but sometimes both fail. I have both at home. Let's give Vishal a minute to join in. But, uh, you know, there are a couple of things I was keeping as well. Um, the cloud skill challenge, which we shared, just make sure you access that. Let me share that cloud skill challenge here. By the way, you can keep posting the questions. So once Vishal is back, uh, we can discuss that those questions there so you back hey. Michelle? yeah i'm back I, I hope this works better let's see <laughs> yes this is better i can hear you okay great yeah I, I, should i repeat the last part of what i was saying or or no i mean the one was obviously lift and share the other was to uh, directly package the things, uh, you know, small services which you have added to that, mm -hmm. so so that you know you can start building and making make use of those capabilities. Uh, those were two things which you talked about. Uh, okay. Is that you want to add more or? Oh uh, no, no, yeah, I think that that covers you know what I was trying to say there. Perfect. So so um, you know from a community's perspective, so. Uh, if I'm using Azure Kubernetes service, um, some of the questions from the community is how do I uh, pick the you know nodes, right? The CPU, how do I gauge the memory, uh, number of requests needs to be sent, as you know, specifically also while designing uh, the manifestations for each and every pod, right? So sure. uh, how do I build those uh, resource limits for that? 
how do i gauge all those things and what is the and is there any best practice to uh, bring out those things right so that was some of the questions also from the community that's a really good question uh, because you know for one customer we were trying to break from monolith into microservices and for monolith they had benchmarks from the previous production experience uh, experience right like this is the memory needed this is the you know cpu needed right but for these new microservices there is no clear cut benchmark uh, to start with so you are starting almost at a blank slate right so the first thing i would do is uh, based on you know your hunch of what the total was for monolith uh, you know versus for microservices you start assigning some uh, cpu and memory limits and then start testing in your staging or you know pre production environment with some real kind of workflow right that gives you a sense of which service is going to consume a lot more of cpu versus which service is going to consume a lot more of memory right secondly there is this project called vertical pod auto scaler and if you deploy that in the recommendation mode you actually start getting recommendations that this service is you know using only this much cpu this much memory and you can fine tune that right so you have to do all this work before you go into production for sure right but that doesn't mean that's the end of the story even if you go in production i think you have to be super super uh, watchful in the initial you know maybe few weeks and and you know probably deploy all these things like uh, vertical pod auto scaler uh, prometheus for monitoring and make sure you are constantly monitoring is a specific service uh, has been assigned you know x cpu and you know x ram and is it falling short or is it you know leaving too much empty you know resources you know for consumption basically right uh, i would say that's the only way if you are shifting away from monolith to microservices do some testing pre prod come to some benchmarks go with those benchmarks into production and then in production make sure you fine tune you know in the initial few weeks to month uh, till you iron out any any potential issues because unfortunately there is no benchmark uh you know with these new services right with production you had the you had the luxury of you know having the past data and saying hey this is what happens but that that data uh for each services uh, how if it is not available like how they pick it up from the monolithic is there a way to pick it up is yeah you could you could logically break and say hey you know in monolith this is you know payment service versus checkout service versus this service is so intense and so on and so forth right if you have any more i don't know like apm tools and stuff which gives you that uh, i wouldn't say exact data but rough understanding that this service is much more intensive compared to this service right you can use those hints but you'll never get the precise numbers uh, you know uh, i would say so while while we are discussing about the monitoring and you know building that information and other things so mm-hmm. how would you uh, define i mean like is there any best practice like you know i was uh, building those alerts and monitoring for uh, doing demos i saw there is so much of information available out there so you know what according to you, like what are those top of top of the mind like five things i need to monitor uh, if i am using a kubernetes cluster in production what is the top five things i need to monitor so that i not i'm now i'm i'm making sure that it is uh, up and running all the time right right um i think if you're moving away from monolith to microservices one fundamental shift is in the monolith world you're looking at machine as a unit of uh measurement basically right whereas in the in the microservices or containers world you're looking at that service as the unit of measurement because one host could have technically two or even sometimes three services basically right so first mo- mental shift is you have to start thinking of virtual machines and you have to start thinking on as a service right one individual service within that service definitely the basic metrics like you know cpu memory disk usage is absolutely a must second tier every service is very unique some services might be disk intensive some might be memory intensive some might be cpu intensive and some might show you know a mix of these behaviors right uh, to give you a sense of those behaviors you need to understand what that service is doing and can you expose any service service specific metrics if i had to give an example uh if there is a worker uh, service which is consuming messages from a message queue right how many messages can it consume per minute is a great metric for you to understand is it scaling you know is, does it need scaling or is it not need scaling right so these are ser- metrics which are very specific to that services function basically that you need to understand as an architect or as a developer and need to embed those into those services right so we talked about two things basic metrics uh and then you know very specific to service metrics right the third thing of course is logs uh if you have a solid logging uh you know design in place you know in terms of the format of the logs the how you log time stamps and those kind of things right that will give you a lot of insights as to what is happening in your production uh, environment or you know uh, actual real environment right probably the third and fourth aspect which may not come on day one is traces right because if the services are fairly complex they are interacting between you know one service calling maybe a bunch of other services to get a specific task done 
you want to trace and understand where are the bottlenecks right uh, and nowadays you know if you see uh, the maturity of these things you know uh, there is effort going on in open source world as well as in the commercial world to correlate your metrics and logs and traces basically right so that that of course is you know very high level of maturity uh, but i would say start with maybe basic metrics uh, some advanced metrics specific to service start with logs and then start thinking of traces and correlating this you know as a as a together single uh, thing basically so i would i would think of that as a five step journey uh, moving to a really observable and you know easily operable platform got it got it so and so you mean to say i need to start with the basics ones which is uh, which is not the uh, obviously in the other world where we used to manage through vms and other things but now more specifically to these uh, specifically like pods and nodes and other things which are very common things common components of communities to start with that and then uh, applications which is inst- you know which is there which is interacting in microservices uh, through tracing and other things build more mature ones uh, in the later stage so that will be yeah, the approach yeah, to build yeah. observability yeah totally and and of course it goes without saying you know it it doesn't stop at you measuring all these you have to have some alerting system which says this is my threshold if it crosses beyond a threshold please inform me either on slack or email or you know page me or call me basically right and then you have to go and investigate uh you know understand what went wrong and next time hopefully do better than you know last time basically so it's it's not like a one step it's more like a continuous process you know over time as you go through the life of the software so uh, so from a you know you know i often get asked this question as a dev, you know uh, from a developer perspective right uh, they do ask me like do i need to know kubernetes because i am a developer i am you know i'm all you know i, I address write python code uh, whether i need to know uh, kubernetes and do i need to know the deployment uh, yaml uh, manifestation building uh, methodologies or do i need to know how to deploy it onto the uh, cloud so this is a very common question every developer has and um, i also wanted to know from your perspective and you have seen the world you have built that for many customers so from your perspective how do you uh, define this like what should be the roles and responsibilities here yeah yeah uh yeah funny enough you know uh, i have been working with a customer and there is one friend i talked to you know you know he's working with another customer almost every company is trying to abstract kubernetes away from developers you know they are saying they still understand the logic the code and as much as possible we'll give them like a very simple interface right you give us a docker image and you tell us a few basic things and based on that you know we will derive what needs to be done you know in the manifest and the those kind of things right and it's a fair uh, you know assumption i would say right as a developer uh, you need to write the core business logic how it runs and how it scales is is not you know something you would ideally care about right but are we there today maybe not you know there are projects you know i, I know there is one project from microsoft i don't recall the name top of my head which is open source project trying to you know address very similar problem right where you yeah. write the basic uh, do, do you remember the name top of your head baby draper uh, right draper yeah draper yes. uh, so they are trying to abstract you know all the underlying complexities of kubernetes and giving you a simpler interface right having said that i think as a developer you still need to stick to some principles right for example not writing to uh, you know local file system right because file system is ephemeral first thing uh, secondly you need to expose the right kind of metrics right beyond cpu and memory as we talked about in earlier discussion you should be exposing metrics like you know how many queues or you know messages can i process per second right those kind of things so so you know typical very well factor apps you know kind of thing if you meet all those things and if you uh, have a right system either internally or using an open source project i think you can you can stay away from understanding kubernetes underlying features uh, so to speak right uh, as a industry and as as projects i don't think we are 100% there yet but hopefully we reach that you know in in some time so uh, for all developers out there you need to know kubernetes <laughs> as of now yeah for now that's, that's there, what it is, I guess. for now you need to know kubernetes <laughs> okay that's answer so so keep that and mark that okay <laughs> cool so uh, so we shall there are a couple of questions from the audience so i'll i'll just sure. you know I'll push it on to the screen so that you you can we can address it uh, and then yeah. probably I, I, if there is time I, i can i have a couple of more questions as well but anyway i just want to make sure that audience gets time so there is a first question um from pravan um it's here on the screen so what are what are the cost included apart from vm and 
compute for AKS in production, uh, like for monitoring infra and notifications, some other license software, etc. Apart from Kubernetes, so I can answer this question. Basically, this is yeah. more of you know, uh, the AKS question. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, VM cost is there, the node cost is there, but master node is for free and uh, master node is of no cost. So we will manage it and it is privately tunneled to the VMs, which is out there. So, and obviously the monitoring cost and other things, there is a notification cost. If you are doing a notification uh, through your SMS and other things, there are a couple of costs which is involved uh, that you can, you know, just go through these uh, pricing documentation and you can, uh, get more information about that. I'll push uh, another question to you, Vishal. I think this is for you. One of the challenges customer face in lift and shift approach uh, is basically sheet amount of upfront cost that customer have to bear when moving to the new cloud platform. So basically, uh, they had to face some upfront cost if they have to move from shift and lift approach. So how do we address that kind of a uh, yeah, I think this is a good question. And irrespective of, you know, you're moving from on-premise to cloud, or you might be moving from one cloud to other cloud, or even within the same cloud, you know, you're trying to move away from virtual machines to, let's say, Kubernetes, for example, right? And if you have production real usage customers, right? I don't think there is, unfortunately, no other way around it, but to let your first system keep running till the point your second system, you know, base, let's say Kubernetes based system is really, really mature, tested, and you know, start rolling out maybe one region at a time or maybe one customer at a time, you know, if you are uh, having that ways or maybe certain functionality, you know, at a time, basically, right? So I would say the sheer upfront cross is really more of uh, having the knowledgeable team who can, you know, tackle these challenges. Uh, the infrastructure cost is probably going to be almost double four or five. It could be three months, it could be six months based on the scale and, and uh, you know, uh, the size of your infrastructure and operations. But beyond that, I don't think you can optimize too much around that. And hopefully, you're, uh, you know, whatever cost, you know, investment you have put in this duration, you reap that benefit in the, you know, later phases where your operational costs are, you know, uh, much leaner, things are moving faster, you're able to go to market faster, you know, with features. Uh, that's how I would say it, you know, and, and typically that's what I've seen in, in typically most enterprises that we have worked with, they find a budget, they approve the budget, and then they, you know, kind of expect that budget to give them that benefit beyond the implementation in terms of, you know, better operational, uh, you know, posture, or, or, you know, better speed uh, of, you know, going to market with features, basically. Got it. So there's one more question um, from Harsha. It's basically is new to these deployment tools. Uh, what is the starting point for me to start it? So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so I, I would say you can start with the cloud skill challenge, which uh, I've just launched. So you right. can uh, definitely go through it and uh, it has a complete end-to-end uh, -end and also a uh, sandbox. It creates a sandbox for you to play around. So that is something which you can use. But uh, yeah, Vishal, so you have uh, other ways to learn as well. So you can just share that as well. Right. So I would say, you know, for Harsha, don't get boggled with too many terms or tools that you have maybe mentioned about. Start with just Docker and Kubernetes, right? Uh, maybe take a simple application either from your, you know, understanding or, you know, from a real world, try to package it, try to run it on your own local machine, right? Beyond that, you can sign up for AKS, you can use kind clusters on your own local machine and start deploying that Docker container image or application into a you know, Kubernetes cluster. And then just focus on getting a good understanding of these two tools or technologies to certain depths, mm -hmm. basically, right? I would I would go to begin with in some depth beyond going you know too much broad in other areas, like you know, maybe Prometheus service meshes, because then you can get easily lost and only know the shallow surface of everything rather than knowing you know something like really well. That, that's the approach I would follow, uh, I would say. Cool. That's a couple of more questions. Um, so running multiple applications in Kubernetes cluster. So what is the best practice? And should I run the same uh, cluster or in different clusters? Right. So first of all, I, I would really you know like to say there is no true best practice, right? Because every customer is different. Every context is different. And, and uh, you know, the answers could be different. So let me take a couple of scenarios, for example, right? So we were working with a travel company. It's a SaaS platform, and you know they were running SaaS platform, uh, uh, you know, for a variety of their customers. And the SaaS platform, you know, the travel platform was built of you know like car booking, flight booking, hotel booking, and you know bunch of other things basically, right? Now 
technically all these are separate applications right car booking is a separate application uh, hotel is a separate application uh, flight booking is a separate application and require very different integrations very different you know systems basically right but since this is a saas customer it did not make sense to have separate kubernetes clusters for all these applications you could technically put all of these into the same cluster scale out the clusters as you need and scale down the clusters as you need right the pros here are you can scale out and in that single cluster based on demand uh, there is operationally more efficient because you know you're managing less number of clusters so to speak right now give me a, I'll, i'll give you a flip side right there's another customer uh, working uh, for typically banks and you know insurance companies they they have a application which is used you know by these financial institutions you know at scale basically right and for reasons either historically or you know security or whatever may be the case every customer wants that their instance is completely isolated from the other company or other customers instance right and traditionally they have been achieving that using vm like one single vm or maybe couple of vms for one customer entirely running only their application so it's the same software being run as copies for each customer right so this is not multi tenant this is multi instance as i would like to call it and i didn't realize till you know last few years uh, earlier this is truly a pattern for a lot of industries and a lot of you know companies there is no multi tenancy there is multi instance so you deploy one instance so to speak for one customer of yours basically right although it's running the same uh, software with maybe few configuration changes here and there basically right now when we started talking to them the question was should we spin up one cluster each per customer or should we you know use a single cluster right there were some customers that insisted on having their own separate cluster because of you know their contractual obligations or you know agreements or whatever of that sort so we went with those customers only with a specific single cluster and all the stack deployed in that cluster but for other tiers or other you know uh, level of their tiers of you know offerings we went with multi tenant clusters so single kubernetes cluster hosting different customers applications in completely different name spaces of course uh, you know so there is soft isolation but there is no hard isolation and it's always a choice of trade off you know of efficiency uh, operational ease versus uh, you know making it uh, a little more hard you know to operationalize right and if i have to extend this example even further uh, you look at uh, any retail company or you know uh, there was a very famous case study from chick fil a right they run a cluster in each of their restaurants i think there you have no choice but to run like you know one cluster in each restaurant and then you know deploy like thousands of kubernetes clusters and that's a very different scale we are talking about so i would say the context of the problem matters a lot uh, don't look for a best practice look for what is you are trying to solve for and what are the choices you are making uh, and what is the requirement of business uh, you know in terms of legal compliance or technicalities i would say sorry that's a long answer but you know uh, it's a pretty uh, nuanced topic you know because there is no straight forward answer here So, so while we are talking about this you know um, what is the role of uh, the virtual nodes which is which is a implementation of virtual kubelets and 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 the keda which is uh, which is the event driven uh, of women driven scale model right so what is right. the role of right. these two uh, different open source tools which is which is a cncf tools by the way so yeah. uh, what will what will that role you know play the role when with respect to this specific question from the you know from the community absolutely absolutely uh, i think you you really you know picked up two projects that i was really excited about you know when i heard about the first time like when i heard the virtual kubelet first time my mind was literally blown i was like this sounds so interesting right uh, so for the benefit of listeners a, a kubelet is the one that is running inside the node and running you know as an agent of the kubernetes cluster right a virtual kubelet is the one where you're running something as a kubelet but it is not necessarily a kubelet it might be a service it might be something else for example right and with virtual kubelet you could run azure container instances as you know as if they were part of your kubernetes cluster basically right and i think this is a great way uh, to run a lot of kind of workloads uh, which could be either you know uh, sporadic not you know running 24 by 7 or or you want to run some workloads where you don't want to manage the container life cycle basically right so so you install a virtual kubelet in your cluster and you assign some annotations or labels so that you know it gets scheduled in the virtual node not in the real node and then it could run technically infinitely scalable within the azure container service you know or any similar service right that virtual kubelet uh, actually uh, supports this right now coming to the second question the keda part of it right and and keda itself stands for kubernetes event driven uh, architecture or something like that i believe right yeah, and uh, scalar <laughs> yeah scalar yeah so uh, the idea there is for any event driven workload right uh, and you know you can look at so many workloads today which are event driven for example if you go and buy something on a website uh there are two events you know uh, triggered one event goes to your warehouse and starts packing your order other event goes to email system and says you know send the email confirmation to the customer right 
so for any event driven workload i think keda is a great great project uh, for two reasons first thing is you're only acting when there is an event and you know spinning up something right so so you're only acting when there is something and not running a service forever the second part of it is that keda keeps the actual workload scaled down to zero and only when there is a event it understands there is a event then it will spin up your pod from zero to one and from zero to one it can go you know like infinite technically right and it will get process those messages which have arrived in either a message queue or a database or some sort of you know data system basically right and once those messages have been processed it will scale it back you know from that scale to almost zero technically right and uh, we have used keda very heavily uh, especially with the fission project right uh, the fission's whole even driven uh, architecture is built the newer version is built using keda and we have written you know connectors for kafka for you know nats for rabbitmq and you know for a bunch of other message queues and there are still more being written as we as we speak to the community <laughs> well i have two more questions so i'll i'll take sure. these two questions from the community so we got time yep. for two more questions um, okay i'll, I'll keep it any... short in, in the interest of time yeah. <laughs> no worries <laughs> so this is a question so it's a long question and you can see that on the screen um, yeah i can right. see it uh lob enterprise apps i think that's a pretty broad classification and and i don't know what all you want to cover in that but i would say if those are apps which are developed custom using languages like you know i don't know .net java you know or on any similar thing and and you have any non trivial skill i would think of evaluating at least kubernetes for sure but if these are enterprise apps which are not container friendly right and and i don't know there are a lot of erp applications there are a lot of crm applications which have been written maybe a couple of decades ago container was never you know in existence in those days right for those things i would look at you know for example uh, is it supported by the vendor like i i remember we were working with another enterprise customer the database that they were using was a licensed database and the licensed database company said if you run this in an enterprise uh, sorry in kubernetes your support is technically lost right so that is another consideration you have to look at uh, but i would say you know again for custom apps evaluate kubernetes for sure for any off the shelf you know that you have purchased crm erp systems database systems first look at the clause of the support of your you know provider and then take a call based on that perfect so one more question is on the screen yeah so can you give me more light on multi tenant applications yep so i think multi tenancy is inherently about you know achieving efficiency and secondly uh, you know trying to do more with less operational effort right if you can you know use multi tenant uh, i would recommend using that unless there are other business reasons not to do so right and i, I don't think multi tenancy is anything to do with kubernetes or you know containers even for that sake right even before these technologies came in picture we have e-commerce websites we have travel websites which have been running multi tenant applications right technically all of your users are using the same system but they don't see what other user is doing or what other data is basically that's that's all it is you know uh, fundamentally i would say and uh, kubernetes kind of gives you the flexibility to do multi tenancy or multi instance or any mix of you know in between that by using the isolation of namespaces by scheduling only certain workloads on certain kind of nodes and those kind of things so so that's all possible so one last question we have before sure uh right uh so for the first and foremost thing i would say is keep your production cluster completely isolated from any other cluster that's like a no brainer right you don't want to have your dev and staging with production in the same cluster so so production a completely separate cluster absolutely no uh, you know uh, two ways about that uh between staging qa and dev you know and and every company has a different set of environments uh, based on their level of maturity of software engineering i would say you can technically club stage and dev and you know qa to be part of the same cluster but you still have to have isolation you know for specific reasons right for example if you are doing performance benchmarking you better not have any other tenants trying to you know to onto your space or you know your areas basically right so if you are doing performance testing maybe spin up a new cluster uh, as good as production do testing tear it down perfect but if you are doing other things like you know normal testing manual testing you know or some automated you know uh, tests running functionality and not checking the performance it is okay to use shared environments and in fact uh, we built out for one customer a uh, uh, a very big shared dev environment where when a person raises a pr you know they can fire a small command on the github ui itself it goes and provisions a completely new namespace with their change code base and rest of the services you know stick to a specific version and gives them a url for testing 
and once their testing is done they can fire another small command in the github you know pr itself and tear down the entire environment right so so there are you know ways to do that uh, but definitely keep production separate and then for performance reasons you know use separate clusters but otherwise you can you can actually go very shared in a way i would say so that's uh, that's it so uh, thanks vishal um, amrish is waiting in in the backstage so i'm going to bring in amrish as well so thank so, you for joining in and ask you know uh, answering all the questions uh, you know from the community there was so many questions i know there will be a lot of questions you can reach out to vishal on twitter or linkedin or even reach out to us uh, we can uh, redirect to you to vishal on a couple of things uh, thanks vishal thank you for your time thank you for joining thank in. you so much for uh, having me here vivek and and really enjoyed all the you know questions and conversations thank you so much thank you sir bye bye hey amrish how are you hello hello thank you for having me on the show i am doing good so welcome, how welcome are you to doing me. all all good i know i'm here at office on a saturday morning um <laughs> i'm enjoying <laughs> <laughs> okay that's very nice excellent session by vishal i was listening in and um, very interesting it it provides a great segue for what we are going to discuss so. definitely so so i mean for the audience you know i just want to uh, introduce amrish right so uh, amrish is you know anyone who knows amrish you know will will say he's a data deep deep learning data science guy and uh, if you just open his profile you will see nasa has recognized him as a citizen scientist because of his data work he does and uh, he is part of the data and analytics team practice team right practice team in uh, tcs uh, and he's a lead consultant there so that is you know welcome amrish uh, for the show uh you know it's it's been a it's pleasure to have you here your 22 years of experience uh and and obviously i'm really excited to see today's uh, you know demo uh, specifically on you know how you're going to use this uh deep learning you know ml models and other things with uh, azure container apps which is a newly launched one and uh, aks you know and and also aci so it's interesting uh, demo as well so I'll, you know I'll, i'll just let uh, you to take this forward uh, i'll i'll yes. in between ask you questions if there are questions uh, but i'll sure. i'll just moderate moderate the questions in from the audience sure Th- thanks vivek and how you want to run this is that it would be you interrupt me any time so this is like uh, discussion type of thing very demo heavy uh, very less slides and don't worry about the code it is in github so you don't have to take screenshots or anything everything will be shared so let's enjoy and uh, the excellent session by vishal will carry on that thing and how as you have picked up the good things that kubernetes is giving and providing you something great that is where we will bring forward so let me share my screen here i am sharing my screen okay and um, yes so these are my coordinates i love connecting so you have all the linkedin github twitter i am everywhere please to connect i am fond of connecting and food so that's what it is and um, so today what we will do is that um, we will discuss about container apps container instances and azure kubernetes services and what we would do is that we would have a very demo heavy approach and hands on approach on explaining those things so how are we going to demonstrate all these things we take a very simple uh, problem that is uh, we take a data set a red wine data set which you can find in kaggle i'll show you of how you can get there but what we will do is that we will create a deep learning model and i can create a deep learning model anywhere so i'm going to show you that how i created the deep learning model take that model out and then make container images which you can run in your local machine and once you are done with your local machine then what you will do is that 
you will deploy it in various places. So a brief thing about what we are going to discuss is these guys out here. Where is the pointer? So Azure Kubernetes services on managed Kubernetes and the container apps, that is the Ignite release, it's still in preview. That's a serverless containers. And I am excited about it once it goes into production and see of how it goes. And Azure container instances. And this is obviously shamelessly copied from here. So the plan today is something like this. We create a deep learning model. And then what we do is that we create a service because we want to make it very separate. So we create a Flux service. And then on top of it, um, I'm not good in UI. So there is an easy way to create UIs with Python. That is uh, Streamlit is a great framework. And I don't know, maybe they'll extend it and it's going good. It's streamly to you, I will make, we'll create a Docker image. We'll verify that it's running in local. We'll create a container registry where we push the image and then we create the container app deployment where we will see certain things that we discussed uh, like a dapper, Kakeda and all these things of how connect the UI with the app and then also create the container instance. Same thing repeated, connect the UI with the container instance and the Kubernetes service deployment also, and we'll use a Streamlit UI. So this is all about theory. So let's jump in. And uh, how does it look? It looks something like this. Uh, this is the app, and you give all these uh, variables, and you predict the wine quality. So before I go into this, I'll show you where is the uh, data set. So this is a red wine quality data set that is there. Oh, it is opening up the same thing. OK. Uh, oh, data is here. So here's the data set. So this is a data set, and it has got around 11 variables. So acidity, uh, sugar, sulfur dioxide, density, pH, sulfates, alcohol. So these are the variables, and you are outputting a quality. So what we will do is that we will create a deep learning model. So this is not a deep learning session. This is more of a container session. So we will not go into depth. But still, I would like to show you something what is said in a deep learning model. So what you do is that essentially you, you select some features that you would use for the deep learning model. We have selected all the features and then we pre-process it, right? We we scale it, we um, and we make it so that it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, so that all of it is in the same scale. And then we divide into a train and a validation set. You see here, it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. It's 10 to the power minus 16, practically zero. And then we do a very simple Keras uh, deep learning model, which is essentially three blocks. This is a block, a dense layer of 32, a dropout, a batch normalization. And these are the three blocks. We use an atom optimizer. We train the model. And then what we do is that we save so this is a model which is trained out here. And then what we're doing is that we are saving it into a file. And it is an H5 file. And also we are doing, uh, we are uh, also saving it as a preprocessor file. So the intention of showing it is that I am training it outside Azure. I am training it anywhere. It is in some public place, a Kaggle, any data set. And I am getting all these data. So these are the two files which I'll pick it up from here. And then I will do the testing of it on an unknown red wine uh, data. 
okay so what i have done here is that i've gone into visual studio and i have gone here and put all these files together the preprocessor.p and a redwine uh, model dot h5 these are the things and then i've done a very simple thing this is a flux service the flask service this is a very simple flux service it has got a dummy method which is the app root slash and the app and the app root predict which does nothing but gets the json uh, from the request and converts to a data frame and calls predict and you can see here i have loaded the preprocessor.p and the models in my space and i am using it here the model dot predict so basically the flow is i am creating some something and then i am getting the data out of it the models and all these things and we are we are creating this uh, prediction okay now this is something which is running in my machine and say suppose uh, this turns out to be a great um, project and I want to show it to the whole world. So what I do is I do a very simple thing. I push it this part, which is like a microservice. And this is my backend service. It has got no UI and I want to push it as a container. So what I first do is that I create a requirements.txt which has got all the dependencies. Because I'm using a deep learning Keras model, I have TensorFlow, I have Flask, I have got scikit-learn and a pandas. So this is my requirements.txt, very simple. Now I do a Docker file, which is having a very simple structure. It is having a Slim Buster image, which if you look at the code in GitHub, a slim buster image is a Debian image, a very slim image. I copy all the files and then I pip install the uh, requirements.txt and then I do a python.app.py and I run the flux service. So all this is done. And then what I do is that I run the Docker steps. So the Docker steps is something like this. Um, I build the docker build minus t redwine flask dot and this what it is doing is that it is creating a docker image so here I have my uh, docker instance so I have already done all these things for the demo so let me bring up my docker local docker desktop okay let it come up so what it would do is that it will create an image and this image I can use it somewhere. So this, uh, so the image, it is the Docker is coming up. So once I do it, the image is ready for my use. So here it is starting and you can see that these are the images so it is starting up, it is taking some time. So, so the intention is we are in this stage of the demo, we have created a deep learning service and we are creating the Docker image. Okay. It is still starting, so let it start. So this is what is uh, going on and you see that uh, this is a red wine flask image so that is already built for me so how you build it is very simple you go here you go to your bash shell i have wsl installed and then what i do is that i go to my folder cd flask apps for me uh, cd red wine cd red wine server and then you do a docker build minus t red wine task and then you put a dot i will not run this because i have already done it so that's how simple it is this image is all in your local machine and now what you do is that you can run it in your machine 
And also what you can do is that Azure is providing you all these other capabilities where you can push it to scale it. So what I'll do is that I will introduce you to uh, a very interesting thing known as Azure Container Apps. So instead of me writing things, I thought it might be worthwhile. I'll just go through what is the Azure Container Apps. So it's coming up while it comes up. For me, it is like uh, uh, I want to have uh, Azure Kubernetes, everything, but without knowing the details of Kubernetes. So it is just a wrapper over that. So it is build and deploy modern apps and microservices using serverless Kubernetes. There is more to it, which we'll see of how it is done. So I have already deployed one. And before I explain of how I have done it, let me just go to my portal and show you of what it has. So this thing also has something called, as you were discussing before, it has got auto scaling built in and Keda is built in with it. It comes just like that for free, and I don't have to do any fancy thing about that. Once I deploy a container app, the Keda comes free with it, and Keda is auto scaling. So we'll see that. You see here in, uh, and it has also uh, the um, uh, Dapper also built in there. So let's see where is Cicada. So this is a container app. And this is where I just want to show you now. And then we'll play around with it a little bit. So you scale here and you can do. So there is no scaling rule. We'll show off how. And th then it has got Dapper. We'll come into Dapper of how we can use that. It is not applicable here, but we can use it here. So let's go on and build. Um, this image that we have got, we'll build an Azure Container App. So this Azure Container App, it has all these capabilities of Azure Kubernetes, but I don't have to know Kubernetes for that. Just a glimpse of what it is giving us is that select any container image using any language or framework. Choose a vCPU and so this is a KEDA part. I can scale on any setting and I can also use service to service communication using Dapper, which will, and then you can create and deploy your application. Now to the how part of how we are doing it, it is very easy. So all this code is in GitHub. So what I have done is something like this. You have to install some extensions. You have to, so you don't worry, all this is checked into GitHub. So the GitHub link I'll share. Uh, so this, you will register the Microsoft web namespace. You create a resource group location. So this is not available in India. If you try it, you will not. It is available in certain regions. Canada Central is one of them. You have a log analytics workspace. You have a container apps environment and then you create a resource group with the location and then this uh, lines will create an environment uh, workspace uh, for that and here we are creating an environment for that and then what we do is very simple here we are creating an azure container registry here with this command so the azure container registry is here if I go here, if I go to the container registries, I have already run this command and I've created the container registry. And then what I do is that if you jump in here, I log into the ACR, the container registry. I tag my, my image that I had built using the red wine flask to the container registry uh, tagging so that I can uh, push it there. And then I push it into the container registry. So this is a pushing into the container registry. It is going from my machine to Azure and I pushed it here, which you can see down here. Uh, yes, repositories. 
red wine flask v v1 so this is the image that is already pulled down uh, pushed here and then what i do is that um, uh, there is some password and uh, username i do i get the and then i create the container app now this container app see how easy it is to do it as a developer my, i do not have to know all the complications of kubernetes will compare and contrast if the same image we had to deploy in kubernetes what we had to do but see how easy it is i have to know as a developer that i am concentrating more on the business logic side of it and which is very applicable for consulting companies like us where we build immensely complex uh, business applications where our developers are uh, not only developers they also need to have very good domain knowledge understand their domain so they can spend most of their time understanding and communicating with the business smes understanding with it and i uh, as you perhaps know that i uh, am very strongly involved with the utility companies um, all over the world and we deal with very complex logic so here you see that it is very easy to do it so here what we are doing is that we are we are associating with the resource group we are associating with the environment we are associating with the image the registry and the password the target port and we also are externally exposing it as an ingress so fascinating stuff after you run this command you will get an ingress url so this is an example of the url down here so we'll get that and i will show you of my um, as your uh, container apps that is already there so this is my container app it is already there and i have the url which is coming up this is the url that is already there now now uh, we were saying about auto scaling so auto scaling we can do by a revision management so if so this one so if i do a create new revision so there is a life cycle um, you can do so so if i say scale so I, I can add a scale rule this is where we were speaking of kda right so this kda is built in into it so you can type my new rule you can take a rule type scaling the concurrent request is maybe 10 and you add it so as as it um, there is more uh, request coming in the replicas will will increase and there is a limit to it one and max you can have this so this is how the kda part the scaling as if i am doing an application web service kind of thing so very automatic for me uh, this application i have not done a dapper container so so you can enable dapper and you can use dapper so dapper is um, distributed application runtime so it is a very simple thing so i have my container and there will be another container which is running alongside to it just like a motorcycle you have seen this fancy motorcycles in flames maybe there's one motorcycle running and then there is some tagged tagged wheel which you do like that a container is there and i have a tagged container to it and this container is doing a very fascinating thing it abstracts certain very good things for me like um, in one of our implementations we are talking about various microservices and one of the things that i hate telling developers is how do you communicate with these microservices you have to write a lot of code here dapper takes care with you and the best thing is that the store in which the dapper writes messages is configurable so sometimes you might say that i want a rabbit mq but maybe rabbit mq is not suiting you so you might want to shift an azure service bus 
you can do it by configuration changes. Maybe next time we'll have a demo with Dapper involved. But you, what I am trying to tell you is that as a developer, as a designer, as an architect, it becomes easy to think of and implement in reality all these things easily with container apps. So that is one thing that I want to show you. And now to do the actual thing, I have this Streamlit, uh, this is already deployed. And so I have a client, which is a Streamlit client. And what I'll do here is that I am connecting. So this is the Jolly Mushroom thing, which is the, uh, which is my Redwine app. Uh, where is it? So this is the Jolly Mushroom application URL. So I am using this, this guy and I am using it in my Streamlit UI. So this, this is the one, so I'll just do it. So this is a URL that I am going to use in my prediction system. And if I just run it here in my prediction system, okay. So let me just run it here. It's uh, CD. Where is my thing? It is copy path. Okay. So it might take some time to uh, run this Streamlit UI. So I'll just close this one and uh, so Stream UI is running and let it take some time. So so what? Yes. So it has come up very easily. So it is running in localhost eight five zero two. Okay. Okay, so this is this is actually connecting to the container app, and if I just run it, let's see of how fast it is going to. It takes some time. So this uh, container app is in preview, so this will take some time. While it runs, maybe uh, I'll just take some questions because it is the first time it is running. It is it. I've seen this container app taking some time to connect and do it. So I just take a pause and see if there are any questions. Uh, oh, oh! I think uh, this Jolly Mushroom is the um, DNS name that it is giving uh, by default. But I think you can you can have your own DNS name. So here here is the DNS name. Uh, that is there when I'm deploying the app. Where is the thing? So this this is uh, giving a default DNS, but I think there should be some ways in which you can configure and give your own own DNS name. So by default, it is giving. So uh, these gives these fancy names: Happy Forest, Jolly Mushroom, and all these things. So here is a thing and it has got it. So it has predicted correctly. Now you can change it. Yeah, so it's changing. I put 11, this is put 12. So this is a way in which you can do all these things. So this is about the Azure container apps. Then what we will do is that um, we will see the same thing now in Azure Container Instance. Now, Azure Container Instance is very easy because I have got the image in the container registry. I have got everything done. So I have to do only one simple thing. That is, I go to my, so all the steps that I've written are from scratch, but if you had, if you are following with me, 
and if you have done the azure container apps you just run this command is it container create and it is uh, the name and then um, here you can have the image image is the same the registry login server username password the port is 5000 because we are running a flux service and it is and here uh, the dns label is red wine app so if i show you here i have created and run this command so what you have to do is that meaning i will not run it but what you can do here is that uh, you can just paste it in your here and provided you have logged into a subscription so it should run absolutely fine after you have done this thing so this as your container instance you can do in the same manner i have deployed it also here uh, in the azure um, portal so if i go to here home container instance so this is my resource group i'll go here if i go to the container instance so is this the one yes sometimes Yes, so this is a container instance. So it is running and this is the fully qualified DNS name, the Redwine app as your container.io. And now you have this running. So basically, if we just revise what we have done, we have created a deep learning image and then we pushed into the Azure container registry. And from there, now it's your playground. You can create a container app. You can create a container instance and this is the container instance so what i do is again i go back to my uh, client so my client is a streamly ty i'll do a very simple thing this uh, console app this streamly ty i'll just push this thing and uh, this thing down and uh, maybe i'll stop this guy I'll stop this guy and then what's then what I'll do is that I will use this as your container instance URL. So now what I will do is that if I run it from here, it will now hit my as your container instance. So the fun thing is that I have now full control. Once I create my image, you can do anything. You can push it to any server, anything that you uh, you are doing it now in Azure Container Instance. Let me just close these and push it. Um, host 8502. And uh, if I do it here, amazingly fast. That is what I like, amazingly fast. Container instance, obviously container apps, maybe it's in preview or something. So this is the Azure container instance. Next, what we'll do is something, the, if you want full control, then you do Azure Kubernetes service. And it's also actually very easy because again, I, if I keep on revising, I've got the container image. It's a deep learning model. I've got the container image. I pushed it into the history. So let's jump in and see of how I do a container, uh, push it into Azure container, um, Azure Kubernetes service. So the steps are very simple. Where is my steps? I'm finding it. Okay. So so these are the steps so here what i am doing is um here i faced one problem here because when i tried to do with the username password it was not giving me some access permissions so i looked up and saw one of the best ways to do is to create a service principle the service principle is kind of uh, not a very fancy definition i can give you this is kind of an identity management and this identity will have some 
rights associated with it. So I'll create a service principle and I will assign it some rights. So I have named this service principle like this, ACR service principle. I'm getting the registry ID by this command. And then I'm creating a role-based access control with this name as a service principle, the scope. So the service principle has a scope. It has a role, which is I'm giving it an ACR pool only. So it will be able to pull it from the registry. So this is ACR pool and I'm getting the password out here. And in, this is what the password is. This is a username. So this is all the service principle stuff, some authentication stuff. But what happens is then I have to create a cluster. So the cluster, there are various uh, things in it. So what I do is that I give it the resource group. This is a wine group. And then I uh, give it a name. I give it a node count one, the service principle and the client secret and attach it to the uh, registry. So this creates a cluster. I have already created the cluster because this takes quite a time. Minimum, I have seen 10 to 15 minutes. So, so this is my cluster. Where is my cluster? This is my cluster. A very nice cluster. This is Kubernetes. Those who love Kubernetes, this is your playground. It has got everything. And now you have namespaces, you have service, ingress, and whatnot you are having. Okay. So no, I'll, I'll show you how I got this. So next, what I do is that I, so all these commands are very simple to run. You will just go here and you will run it command from your batch cell. So uh, meaning since I have run it, you just copy paste and run it yourself or you put it in a script and you can make it a .sh file and you can run it. But the most important thing is that you will, you will deploy it using an YAML file. So what is an YAML file? Uh, maybe we have seen it before. So this is the YAML file that I have given. So this YAML file has two parts. It has got a deployment part and it has got a service part. The deployment part will deploy the images into the registry. The image here is the AG Wine ACR Red Wine Flux V1. It has got the replicas, which is three. That means three replicas of the will be there. And there is a concept known as pods. So these running instances are called pods. So it will do here. See of how we are shifting. See in the container apps as an architect, as a developer, uh, we were not considered that we have to know all these gory details, right? Scaling would be automatic. So these I have to specify. The replicas are here. And now we have to expose as a uh, service, a red wine service, and it is exposed to 5000. We can see of how it is running from here. So if I go here, kubectl, so see here, wonderful. I like this setting of the Z shell. I type kubectl and it tells me I'm in the wine case cluster. Get oh, so very fascinating now technology is. So these are running and um, CTL get service. So this is a red wine service that is there. And this red wine service is, is running in the 2200, 106.875000 port. You can also see it from your, your here. Uh, this place, your red wine service is also here from the portal. You can see the external IP here and you can expose, you can get this. In, in this in this place also, I'll do have some fun. What I'll do in this case in the Streamlit UI, I will comment this out and this is my URL. I can use this and let me just stop stop this stop this thing and so this is this is uh i am running the kubernetes now
So again, so now I am connecting to Kubernetes. Same thing. So now I am hitting the Kubernetes cluster. That's it. So this is what I wanted to show you from Azure Container App, serverless containers, no nothing, but you get all the benefits of Kubernetes. You are having KEDA, that is a scaling up the Dapper. I have not demonstrated Dapper, but you can do a lot of Dapper things there. That comes free with it. And then you have the Azure Container Instances, which is the base container running on hypervisor kind of things. And then you have the AKS, which is managed Kubernetes. So if you want total control, uh, then go for a case and maybe this has your container apps is in preview. I'm sure many of us will deploy, uh, will start experimenting with it, push it and test it limits and see of how it performs. So that's the whole uh, thing. And I'm sure that you will try all these new things. So that's it from my side. And another thing that I wish to share is that if you're interested, I've got a lot of videos in my channel, which is this YouTube uh, channel out here. Uh, you can have a look at it. Uh, so this uh, is a full blown channel. And what I intend is becoming the one stop shop for various data science related things. There is a Kubernetes section out here, which I am planning to add more. And also deep learning stuff is also there. So please feel free to do spark is also coming up and all these fancy things also coming up. I want to engage more with you through this. So that's one of the things. So I just pause here and see if there are any questions. So I, I have a you know, you know, question. So, so I'm, uh, there are three different ways to deploy this image, right? So if if as a you know if i have to choose different business use cases for these three different yes yes this uh, is where i can deploy which are those uh, why i would choose different ones like if i have to uh, deploy this uh, specifically on kubernetes why should i choose kubernetes or why should i choose azure container apps yes is that's a great question um, so we have recently deployed uh, some production high high production apps in um, in Azure Kubernetes services, and till now, what news we are getting is that it's running fine. But the problem with AKS is that um, you have to know all these things. You know when to scale. You you have to know if you have to scale. Maybe you can use KEDA, but you have to know KEDA. And then then another thing that we were saying, like microservices are there, and there will be lots of microservices in a production system. You will have maybe in your domain, maybe 20 domains might be there for a complex uh, application, and your microservices will be zigzag, zigzag. They will be talking to each other. For that, what you will do is that you will create a queue, and then you have to manage that queue. You'll have to understand maybe your RabbitMQ, maybe you have to understand an Azure service bus and all these things. So as a developer, um, oh, shall I invest more time in understanding the mechanics of a, a RabbitMQ and uh, the classic queue or whatnot queue? Or will I say whether the RabbitMQ is perfect or not? A service bus is there. Somebody else will say, this is an abstraction which I really like about Azure container apps. So it gives you that flexibility uh, that you can put a dapper and the dapper takes care of that abstraction. So I am seeing container apps if it is, it's still in preview though. So once it goes much and we test more, I'm seeing, I'm excited to use that. And maybe as your Kubernetes service is much maybe when I want full control of it, that's a place. So as your Kubernetes services, as you know, it's running fantastic now. So, so that's what, um, so I am feeling that in future, we might see more applications coming in with container apps after it has been removed from preview. And Microsoft has more fun, more, more awesome documentation with Dapper and everything coming in. I'm sure that there is many. 
and um, the community is awesome. And so I'm excited to see of how it builds out from there. Definitely. I think it's a very exciting uh, launch as well. So the, if there are, I mean, uh, just post the questions. Uh, if audience wants to ask questions to Amrish, there is one question, though. Uh, I'm just posting that question to you, Amrish. That's a great question. How it automate multiple pipelines? I'm not sure of how we can. I'm able to answer it, but I'm sure that you can push integrate it with uh, GitHub Actions. You can integrate with Azure DevOps because some of our customers are doing it with Azure DevOps. So you can use uh, these um, EML files and you can use them to automate your pipelines in conjunction with Azure DevOps and GitHub Actions. Any more questions? We let let's wait for two three more minutes uh, for any more questions from the audience. While we are waiting for you know questions to come in, uh, I want to say two things. One is, you know, I've just launched the uh, Cloud Skill Challenge, so you know it's, it's it has all the learning you know workshop. Uh, for Kubernetes itself, so building a protection on great Kubernetes. So just go and uh, you know deep dive into it. It is just enabled for 15 days, so you can just go and make sure that you in the next 15 days you complete it, and you have uh, you are using the sandbox and all those things which is provided in the learn module itself. So please take the advantage of those sandboxes, and. Uh, the other thing is the survey link, which is on the screen, right? So, you know, just go to the survey link, key in the event ID, and uh, give us the feedback of this event so that we can come back with uh, good content. Uh, you know, we can meet uh, you know, different uh, community leaders for your different topics if you want to want us to drive. So please uh, share your uh, topics as well. Like if you have any specific topics we want to uh take up uh in next few uh, next few reactor sessions uh we would invite uh you know different set of community leaders who are in that right who are in that space who are working on it so can come and give their uh, insights in these events so that's something which uh, i just wanted to call out so is there any any other questions uh let's yes this is uh this recording will be available uh, it's on YouTube already, right? So it's, it's available out there. It's, it's streamed directly to the YouTube channel of Microsoft Reactor. So you can uh, go back and refer it as well uh, whenever uh, you want to go back and do all these, uh, you know, work on these things. And if you want to access the code, it is also will be able to made available on the GitHub repo. If you have missed that, uh, let me share the GitHub repo as well in the chat. So just give me a minute. Um, there is there is one there is question how, how how application logs are stored in the container world i think you can log it to different places that's one thing so you can use it to log it to uh, application insights maybe you can use that and you can connect to many other providers where you can log. Um, Vivek, if you have any more insights into that, um, I remember yeah, so, doing it. For, hmm. So hmm. you can use a bunch of tools. Uh, I can, hmm. And uh, just give me a minute. Just I'll share the GitHub repo. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, yes, there are a bunch of tools like you can use uh, Azure logs, uh, which is that you can enable uh, if you have attended the first session, you can enable you know, logs and metrics and other things and uh, directly it will live stream Azure monitoring is directly live stream the containers logs if it is on, hosted on Kubernetes as well. Um, so you can see the uh, logs directly. That is one part of it. The other, apart from that, you can use different tools oh. as well. The open source tools yeah. like yeah, the it Elastic, is. And Elastic and other things. So you have yeah, yes, yes. 
yes yes yeah uh, uh, here it is uh, these are yeah, the things so you have yeah. oh my god so you've got alerts you've got metrics you've got diagnostic settings logs all in built actually yes. so so, so with you, this you don't so have to use the uh, different things by the way so uh, um, yeah, but you know in you know various tools you, you can logs. use open source tools which is there for sure hmm. Yes, you just have to. Oh, yes. So stupid me. I mean, I I use the log analytics workspace, right? So that log analytics workspace will have all those logs. So so that is the thing. You have to enable it. So this for the cluster. So you have enabled the log analytics workspace. If you enabled for the cluster, a case cluster, and for for this guy for the environment. For the container apps, or already you have the uh, cluster. Uh, already you have the logs in there. Somehow it is not appearing. Should be appearing somewhere. So you already have very much inbuilt logs here, actually. Yes. So, so this guy is much more mature. So you are seeing it. Uh, this cluster one that you are seeing. Uh, very much into this true oh. cool so um so let me bring back uh the server link so go ahead and uh -huh. make Sorry. sure people uh -huh. can uh -huh. take the server link and and um, i will also share the for... github yeah just share, share the, the GitHub. Then, uh, yes i will share the github also uh so that you don't have to uh, where is the github so this is i am trying to make it very uh, comprehensive here and uh, comprehensive yes so i have put the link very comprehensive you will have all it in one place and you can fork it and whatever i have shown you can reproduce it and obviously you know my LinkedIn and blah blah, all these social media all over the place. So many social media is there nowadays. So, and the YouTube channel is there. We can communicate, and um, Vivek is there. We are all very active in the community, and um, we love talking. <laughs> <laughs> that is what we are. <laughs> yeah. So cool. So, anyways, um, I think. Uh, there are no much question and it's also lunch time mm. for all of us mm. you know it's saturday mm. afternoon lunch time you know we are all our foodies by the way so we need exactly. to make sure that we take care of that mm. school mm. stuff so mm. um just take the survey link uh, i'm thank you for uh, uh, joining in amrish and uh, sharing all mm. your insights thank you, thank you audience mm. for uh, joining it joining in today and i hope uh, all the sessions were good. They were good discussions. I learned a lot uh, in interacting with, uh, you know, Vishal Biani and Renu showed some lot of things. And Amrish session was obviously had so many things to learn there. So thank you very much uh, for uh, joining in. Thank you, Amrish. Thank you all. Have a nice weekend. Yes. Take care. Bye bye. Mm. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Very well. Okay. Bye.